call this meeting of the committee of the whole of the Board of Education to order at 5.32 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Dixon? Here. Okay. Mr. Rollins? Here. Mr. Scrivano? Here. All right. Mrs. McCulloch? Here. Here. Mr. Siegel? Here. Mr. Connor? Here. Mr. Escobedo? Here. With seven present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank Rod and Connor, who are here um, working behind the scenes to produce our board's broadcast on Channel 20. Thank you, gentlemen, for all you do to make us look good, uh, which isn't, easy, which isn't always easy. And I would like to remind all the board members that um, we hold our questions uh, during presentations and make notes and write them down, and then we'll do the questions after the presentations are completed. So the first thing we have to do is app uh, approve the meeting minutes from October 16th. Are there any changes, corrections, or additions to those minutes? Seeing none, everybody okay with a consensus vote on approval of the minutes? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to new business. Dr. Jarrett and Ms. Yar will present the first new business item, which is the intergovernmental agreement with the Rockford Park District. I have invited uh, Jay Sandine from the Park District. He's, he's been kind enough to be in the audience in case there are any specific questions. But this recommendation is mine in conjunction with the uh, legal counsel that helped us draw it up and also uh, Ms. Yar from the uh, CFO perspective. Ultimately, the reason I am wholeheartedly recommending that the board authorize this, and again, this is our first opportunity to take a look at it, and we will follow up uh, at, at the next meeting. Uh, but the reason I feel strongly about this is that while there, in theory, on paper, would be revenue that would be able to be drawn from this entity going from a public entity to a private entity, the reality is that would not happen because the deal is contingent upon all of the local uh, all the all the local districts providing this abatement. Um, I think this is a significant investment in our community, and I think it does a couple things. One, it potentially could drive nearby development, which could drive EAV up. Number two, it takes annual risk away from the park district. Uh, Mr. Sandine has reported to me on multiple occasions, and he's been done this very publicly in their budget sessions that were available to the public to take part in. Um, They've had variances of two to five hundred thousand dollar losses that they have to budget for annually. That puts significant pressure on their budget annually during that process, which makes it more difficult for them to hold the line in the levy. So I do know that that is an investment that uh, part of the, the the value of this investment is it takes pressure off their budget. They do have some good years where it's profitable, but that's more like one in five with, with, with weather patterns having to be almost perfect for them to have a profitable year. Um, three, I think, again, in addition to the reinvestment in creating potential outside value, I think the reinvestment also will take what could become a slowly depreciating asset and avoid blight. Um, I don't think the property, uh, the park district is in a position where with that risk annually, if they weren't able to find a suitor, that they would have been able to prioritize continuing to subsidize this property. They have other strategic priorities. And so I think the other alternative is a slowly depreciating asset that um, goes from a one in five or a four in five year money loser to ultimately something that the park district ultimately has to abandon. They have significant debt that they have to deal with on that property, so it's not something they could just walk away and demo, uh, because, and, and that's part of how this deal is structured, is to protect them in those areas. So those are some of the reasons why I ultimately support this. I think we are ultimately in a position where we could gain additional revenue because it helps with uh, the, the possibility of hotel development just up the road at the Riverside Corridor, or even in that area. And I think the risk is highly mitigated uh, for annual losses for the park district. And it becomes an asset that becomes an appreciating and strengthened asset as opposed to an asset that, frankly, is, is, is likely to weaken over time and become less appealing uh, to our community. So for all those reasons, I do support this. And I have Mr. Sandine available if you have specific questions uh, from the park district's perspective. Okay, Mr. Siegel. 
the questions that I have are actually going to be on behalf of a community member who emailed these to me. So I want to thank Paul Carpenter for bringing them to my attention. Do, do you want Mr. Sandin to come up to the mic? Uh, if he'd be so yeah. kind. Yeah, okay. There's a button on there to turn the mic on, Jay. So there were a couple of concerns that were brought to me um, that I'll ask on this person's behalf. The first is the park district and the school district have been really pretty tight partners, um, particularly with providing uh, reading incentives to our students. And being a parent of kids who have taken advantage of those incentives and seeing truckloads of other families who are also taking advantage of, of, of that, I know that that has been a fairly significant um, you know, partnership. We'll want to know if, if that continues. The, so I, I guess we'll do that one because the other one is really different. That doesn't sound like it. OK, there we go. There. All right, thank you, David, for your question. Um, actually, as far as reading programs go, Six Flags is very well known for their, for their partnerships and, and wanting to, to partner with local schools. Um, I, I know this, um, just working with them, talking with them, and we have our daughters go to Brookview Elementary School, and they bring home their Brookview Bobcat newsletter all the time, and Six Flags is actually all over in their newsletter. So Six Flags is already partnering with Rockford Public School. Uh, students and reading programs and incentivizing kids and trying to get them to Gurney. Um, what I'm excited about is if they're, if they're partnering with the local schools now and they're not even in our community, I, I know when they're in our backyard, they're, they're going to want to do even more of that. So I'm very confident that, uh, that that's not only going to continue, but it's probably going to be at a much higher level than the park district's able to do right now with our current financials. Okay, well that's encouraging to hear. Uh, I would certainly like to see something maintained at the very least. I think that this particular reading incentive has been a very good one. Honestly, we have not taken great advantage of the Six Flags uh, incentives. And maybe it's just because the, you know, it's just not conveniently located for us. Um, but also the, I think the the value perspective has been so stronger on the Magic Waters and getting for for free is pretty good incentive. Um, another concern that he brought to me was with the park district's own admitted difficulty in maintaining uh, or trying to be profitable and it being dependent upon the weather. And it seems with if 80% of the time the weather causes the park district to lose money, that it would be fair to assume that they're going to, the Six Flags will have the same difficulty. Any corporation that's going to face an 80% chance of losing money um, seems like they'd better have some sort of good solution to offset the weather in order to continue operating because, you know, they're a public company and I'm sure their shareholders are not thrilled about an 80% chance of them not being profitable. And if that sort of pressure causes them to, to leave the area, uh, we are indeed still going to have to face the issue of, of blight. But would it be reasonable that if we're going to have this, you know, the, this park that maybe they decide they're, it's not a good business decision for them to have, it seems like giving them the abatement and they just walk away from the park isn't very desirable either. Could we require that for every year that they are receiving the abatement, and as I read the contract, it's a 10-year agreement with three additional 10-year options, that each year that they get the abatement, they're required to be open. Well, the first off, David, if I can, I'll answer some of those in sequence. The, the tax abatement is for 20 years. So the IGA that you have before you is, is for a 20-year abatement. So it's a 10-year abatement. Then there's a portion of that IGA that authorizes the park district to be able to extend that for another 10 years. Um, so the overall lease with Six Flags is up to 40 years. 
but the IGA before you is only a 20-year tax abatement. And the reason why we asked for 20 years is because uh, the annual bond obligation that Dr. Jarrett referenced goes for 17 years. So we tried to only do the tax abatement for to capture at least the 17 years and then a couple extra years for us to, to recoup some of our losses uh, from that gap. Um, as far as weather dependency, um, I'm very confident with Six Flags Great America, this is the world's largest amusement and theme park company. Um, this is their expertise. This is not the park district's expertise. Um, we, we at the park district do not have the financial flexibility to handle rainy, rainy summers anymore. We used to be able to when golf courses were profiting, um, but that's, those days are, are long gone and everything. Six Flags Great America, they, they have millions that they're, putting, that they're gonna put into the park. They have a huge marketing budget. They're gonna be uh, reaching out to areas beyond what we were able to reach out to. And, and I know they've got the expertise to, to not just depend on mother nature, um, and you can see that with, um, with their extended operating days into, into the fall and into the winter months that we would never be able to, to do that. Um, so they've got greater financial flexibility and the expertise to handle those. Um, as far as them walking out, if we can get a full abatement of all 11 taxing authorities, uh, they cannot walk out. There's, there's no way in our contract with them. We work very diligently to make sure that once they're in, they're in. And the only way they can pull out is if they don't have a full abatement of, of the taxes. Um, that's why it's so important that we have a full full abatement of all 11. And then they're here for, for 20 years and, um, and they can't get out. We did that because we, if they just walked out, then the park district would have to ramp up efforts to get back into running that water park, which would be very difficult for us to do. Um, but at the end of the day, the park district still owns Magic Waters. The, the Six Flags is not coming in and buying it. Through this agreement, we're just choosing to outsource um, the operation. So, so it's a tr true triple net. Six Flags is going to come in. They're going to handle all operations, <coughs> marketing, maintenance, capital investments as a part of our agreement. So they've, they're committed to investing millions into the water park, which we do not have. Um, they've agreed to using all local uh, contractors for that work. Um, and so there, there is no out for them. They're, they're here for 20 years as long as we have all, all 11 taxes abated. That's why this is so important. So I guess just to be clear, their being here for 20 years means that there's a promise that the park is going to be open and operational Absolutely. for those 20 years. Absolutely. Super. Without question. Okay, thank you for addressing this person's uh, questions. I yeah. appreciate it. Mr. Connor. So I have more of a comment, but <clears throat> I agree that these are never difficult or never easy decisions. It's always difficult because it's tax money, but uh, we haven't been collecting it, to be clear, for the three people out there. Hi, yeah. who are watching. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other part is that uh, as was said, the partnership is strong, and I think <clears throat> in that spirit that the commitment from the Park District, as I understand, is still the closeness of the relationship. So things like incentives for kids on the reading programs, um, whatever equivalent there might be that the Park District has left at its command is still <coughs> part of the picture. Is that not the case? Absolutely. Yeah. So. From my point of view, that partnership continues uh, in a good way. Uh, the other part is that I'm heartened to hear that Six Flags has a good relationship and that that will continue, because uh, I do think that's important. One of the questions I've gotten from um, the constituents out in my area, because just as an FYI, <laughs> uh, Magic Waters happens to be in uh, Subdistrict uh, F. Um, was about um, lo you know libraries, whether it's local libraries up by us, but um, it could be um, other ones. Will there be any kind of relationship with those libraries? Will they get any incentives either from the park district itself or through Six Flags? Has this been discussed at all? Yeah, um, what we would like to do is is keep this IGA you know similar for all all eleven. We don't want to strike up 11 individual deals with sure. everybody because then you know then the concern is it's cost prohibitive for 
uh, for Six Flags. It doesn't make sense for them to, to offer it. And just to be totally transparent, when they first came to us uh, in March, I mean, we, we had to divulge all of our financials from the water park over the past five years, and they're not pretty. And they looked at that, and their, their first offer was literally, you know, why don't we just come in and take the water park off your hands? I mean, they literally yeah. were not going to give us one yeah. cent, and we, we negotiated uh, for seven months to get up to that 425 and, mm -hmm. and then the minimum capital investment. So, so these guys are, they're, they're smart, they're experts at this. And um, I, I fear that if each taxing authority wants to try and get a little bit of money out of the deal, it, it will not happen. There's not enough money to have everyone benefit from this and sure. then we would lose out on, on the opportunity to bring them in. Okay, so what I'm hearing is the answer is that <clears throat> Um, if there are, if you will, current arrangements, that those arrangements would probably go away under this agreement. Um, is there potential for, say, substitutions for reading programs? Because obviously, it all, say specifically like the libraries, a lot of value. We have a good relationship with them Absolutely. as RPS. Yeah. And the and Mike, so just you know, the park district still donates passes to the library for their fundraisers and. Yep. That will continue. That has okay. nothing to do with this deal. Right. And, um, you know, and that, that's the same with, with us and, and everybody. We're always donating. <clears throat> so what I'm hearing is that the relationships with the park district will continue. Yes. And even though it changes hands, and it won't be exactly the same in terms of what it is today for obvious reasons, the relationship with the park district will stay the same and the encouragement of reading programs, et cetera, Absolutely. will still be around with Absolutely. the community. Okay. Um, I'll just say, um, I know we don't have our vote tonight, but I'm very much in favor of this. Um, uh, it's a difficult position for the Park District, <coughs> and I, I'll just say that I've heard from a number of constituents that nobody wants that to just be sitting out there, and everybody understands the position that the Park District in, is in. So, and, and honestly, Mike, we've actually taken a page out of this, our local public schools <coughs> playbook, and of followed your master plan in the community i've spent a lot of time with dr jarrett and, and your team and have kind of followed in your footsteps on how you engage the community we did that all throughout this year in Absolutely. every neighborhood and we heard resoundingly from from the community feedback this year that they want their limited tax dollars going back to their neighborhood parks and their neighborhood mm -hmm. programs and their playgrounds and we heard consistently from everyone that we should not be in the water park business and we need to seek privatization and yeah. and try to sell and, and focus our limited resources on you know in, in our neighborhood so so this supports what our community and our taxpayers told us all year okay cool thank you mr dixon <coughs> yes um <clears throat> i'm in favor of it i just I, I get it like you said it's the best business sense um but the question that um i think dave Right, because I thought it was in 10 years increments too. So it is 20 years, and from my understanding, if they once once this is approved, or if it's approved, um, this 20 years, and then you have the option for 10 years as the park district, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you have to come back to us again in 20 years? In, to in 20 years, we would have to come back, but in 20 years, sir, we, we wouldn't have that $600,000 a year anymore. That, that, that annual bond payment would be paid off in 17 okay. years. So I can't predict who's going to be here in 20 years. Right, but I, 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 but we, we would we probably wouldn't need to ask for a tax abatement because okay. we wouldn't owe 600 grand a year in year 20. So that would be an opportunity for, for this to go on the, on the tax rolls then. Okay. So they're willing to invest millions. They are. They're. They're in. In our contract with them, they're investing a minimum of three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars a year for every ten years, um, and that's just minimum. And what they've told us verbally is, is they are going to want to come in and make a big splash here in the first couple of years and invest heavily. But that's just the minimum amount, and they've guaranteed that to be one hundred percent local local contractors. All right. Sounds good. Could you talk a little bit about? job loss or job growth with particularly teens and for our, the youth of our community who many of them get jobs out there. So what would be lost if, if the whole thing 
is closed and what would be gained if we do the deal? Yeah, if we do the deal, there's a lot to be gained, uh, Ken. And what's, what's exciting is Six Flags, again, came to us. They sought us out and they saw the reputation of the Park District of Magic Waters, of our lifeguards, um, and they knew what they were getting into when they came. And they told us from day one that they don't have 300 teenagers in Gurney that are gonna come with right. them to operate the park. So they want literally all of our team members, not just our seasonal kids and our high school students, but also our, our full-time team members. That was a requirement from us, is that nobody lost any positions or anything. And they came in and were blown away with the level of team members that we have there. And so they are literally trying to hire everybody. And, and in fact, this is just to give you a, just a little bit of a difference between a big private sector company like this and, and the park district. They are coming in and they've offered uh, positions for all the teenagers just for this month so that they can come to Gurney. They're going to they're gonna send buses up to pick the kids up, bring them to Gurney just so they can learn their new systems, meet six flag staff and then bring them back at the end of every day and, and so they're fully committed to not just leasing the park they're fully committed to partnering with this community and, and all of our wonderful you know institutions sure okay uh any other questions for jay all right thank you for being here okay thank and you very uh, much everyone i appreciate it this will um return as an action item at our november 13th board meeting um, so, Jen Masek, I think you're next with Reading Horizons Elevate Pilot. Good evening. Hi, Jen. How's everyone doing? Hey. So, I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, our pilot proposal for Reading Horizons Elevate. Um, as you know, we've had some declining um, park scores uh, continually over the last few years. Our attainment of grade level standards in reading, um, I would say less than um, half of our students are reading at grade level. Uh, we've had inconsistent supports throughout the district. Um, elementary schools have been using a variety of um, different intervention tools. Um, not very many of them have been doing them with fidelity. Uh, and then they're using different tools at different schools without any collecting any data to determine which interventions are working. Um, so we have been um, working with the schools to identify different needs. Um, and one of the things that we found is that our fourth and fifth grade students are lacking foundational literacy support if they hadn't attained that yet by the time they get to fourth grade. Um, we've, uh, we need evidence-based strategies. Uh, it's a state mandate for part of MTSS. Um, uh, several of our schools have been using the Reading Horizons Discovery Program uh, for fourth and fifth grade students. So they're taking kids um, from fourth and fifth grade down into the lower levels to use that program. Um, because the intervention strategies are good. However, it's not grade appropriate um, and using uh, the Elevate program would be. Um, we've looked at some, oh, I'm not flipping. That's the background. <laughs> um, we've looked at some alternative choices. Uh, Read 180 and System 44 are two programs we currently use in our middle school. Um, however, those programs are used more as for core instruction um, rather than as a legitimate uh, intervention. Uh, we have the LLI kits that many of our schools have been using, um, and those are more of a whole language, um, and they don't, they don't dig down into um, specific targeted areas of concern. We could continue using the current supports that we've been using. However, uh, like I said, our testing results aren't what we want them to be. So we've recognized a need for change. Um, what we'd like to propose is the Reading Horizons Elevate program. Uh, this program is actually designed um, as an intervention and not as core instruction. Uh, it aligns to the Reading Horizons Discovery program. They use a lot of the same methodology. 
So students who have been exposed to that in grades K-3 uh, would get an extension of that in fourth grade if they hadn't met those um, foundational skills yet and aren't proficient yet. Um, and it also would give students that are new to the district the opportunity to um, develop the same skills and strategies that our, our students have developed in K-3. Um, it is evidence-based and there are components of it that will adapt to individual students' needs as well as small group instruction. We found um, that the Reading Horizons Discovery Program has had um, good results for our students. Our test scores went up um, in the pilot program for that. Uh, students who received the, the discovery um, intervention, or core instruction actually, uh, did better than the schools that didn't have that. Uh, we're just as hopeful for the Reading Horizons Elevate program. Um, again, this would, uh, this would just be for fourth and fifth grade students um, for the pilot. And, um, it would include our special ed students our, and our, our general ed students as we're looking for a targeted area or profile of a student that would this intervention would fit best. Um, the total cost for this pilot for four schools is $85,980. That includes the training for the teachers, the kits for the instruction, all of the curriculum pieces, um, and all of the uh, support um, necessary uh, resources and tools for supporting it, such as their headphones that each of the students would need uh, to do the program. Assessing the situation, so we would be using uh, comparative schools that don't have this intervention strategy. Uh, so we have each of the four schools that we have, we've uh, assigned a sister school to so that we can look at map data from both uh, the schools that are receiving the intervention and the schools who are not. Um, we'll also be comparing students' growth uh, first semester before receiving the intervention to their growth second semester. So we'd be looking at um, uh, repeat measure tests for that as well as a comparison test. Um, we also will be uh, monitoring um, through the use of Easy CBM and through the Reading Horizons Elevate dashboards. I think we have a pretty thorough uh, methodology for determining um, whether or not the intervention is, has been successful. And then uh, we have a variety of students and student groups that we'll be using this with as well. So we'll also be able to determine a profile of a learner um, and what areas of deficit would benefit from this intervention the most. Um, we're hoping to reduce the achievement gap in reading and improve all of our, our test scores across the board. It would be available for all kids. It's, um, Though we're looking at it f as an intervention for um, Tier 2 and Tier 3, it would still be available for core instruction um, as needed. Again, and then we'll look at all of that data at the end and determine which groups it would be the most beneficial for. So um, what we've done so far is we've uh, asked schools to volunteer to pilot this program. Um, we gave them all of the information of what the pilot would entail. We met with staff, um, had opportunities for multiple question and answer sessions. And then finally, we asked for a teacher commitment um, to implement, making sure that they were implementing the program with fidelity. Our next steps will be to get training uh, for the teachers, and that will happen in January. Uh, we'll be analyzing the data at six-week intervals um, and up bringing updates to the board in April and June. Um, and 
then hopefully a soft rollout in August in which schools could opt into um, using the Reading Horizons Elevate program for all of their fourth and fifth grade literacy interventions. All right. All right, questions and comments? Mr. Connor. There we go. Um, <clears throat> when I read the materials, I was just kind of looking at it. It looked like um, MTSS is a part of this, although I think the summary didn't see it so much. So what is the relationship of how this is going to work and the MTSS? There we go. Um, the relationship between this and MTSS is that MTSS is a process for identifying students who need inter academic interventions. And so once we've identified them, then we want to make sure that we're aligning the student's greatest area of need with an intervention that's targeted towards that need. And this particular intervention then is um, targeted towards students who need foundational literacy skill building. I guess <clears throat> part of my question, though, is so, and I, and trust me, I'm just trying to get up to speed on the MTSS as I've been reading about it, but if you look at it, <clears throat> its approach, uh, as you said, is this assessment. So is this one piece related to that? Did it come out of that? Is it going to be driven out of that? Is this on its own? You know what I'm asking? Um, Does that make sense? I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but in general, um, this is a, a piece of the interventions that would support the MTSS process. Okay. So I guess <clears throat> the tenor of my question is their relationship, so if this is successful here, mm -hmm. we're tracking it through the MTSS process, and yet there might be other things that will come up that are not this, but similar. Well, we have several other different intervention options for students. Um, one of the things that's really important about MTSS is making sure that your intervention matches the student's need. Um, so this would just be one piece of that. So there's an overall assessment at the MTSS level. Yes. And this is a piece of it. Yep. So that's how it fits. Sure. Yep. All right. I'm, I'm asking the question because I want to make sure I understand what's driving this, you know, because um, presumably we're going to be looking at this and you got it in four schools, mm -hmm. and if it's successful in that, then we'd want to, I assume, replicate it. So yes, as yeah. you're doing this, will there be other assessments that said, hey, this went well, this is another, because it, from my point of view, it seems like this MTSS is kind of like the foundation, isn't it? That the that's what's driving us? Yes, MTSS is, is, is making sure that students are receiving the adequate supports for their, for their learning needs, and, and this is a, just a piece of that. So yes, we'll be using data um, and easy CBM data. We'll be using this data and the MAP data all to triangulate and make sure that this is the right intervention for kids. I saw your head here. Uh, maybe for clarity, um, MTSS is our entire system, right. and part of that system, um, as Jen noted, is aligning the appropriate intervention with the appropriate need, right. and so this is one particular intervention where we know we have gaps across the district, um, and now that we're in year two of Reading Horizons Discovery and we're seeing some real results there, um, we see a benefit in moving beyond third grade and helping our students who have gained some of that foundational literacy skill in the last two years but have not yet gained all they need to be truly successful readers by middle school. So what this does is it provides that intentional intervention beyond the core instruction for fourth and fifth grade. So the MTSS is really the framework and so um, this is one intervention or one strategy yeah. within the framework aligned to students and their needs. Yeah, and that's kind of what I read and I wanted to confirm that. So one, thank you, you both confirmed it. But then I think maybe part of the point would be, are we going to show it that way? Because a lot of times, and I think we've said this before, a lot of these programs seem like they're one 
And I don't want to say, because I know they're not isolated, but it feels that way. And if it's really within a framework, and it's helping us go towards an endpoint to visualize that. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, a lot of times I know when I read through these, I think in and of itself it sounds like it makes sense, but if we've got this broader program and that is the framework, then I want to see the measurements of success in relation to that, because that sounds like that's driving it. Yes, and, and we have moved rather slowly and deliberately as a team to ensure that this pilot or this field test is really action research. Okay. So we have trial schools, we have control schools, very similar to what we did with Reading Horizons Discovery um, with the seven trial schools. Okay. Um, and so then we'll have some comparable data across the board that will help us see at what rates our students grew more or less with the treatment than without the treatment. Um, and then that can be tracked over time in school problem-solving teams as they utilize the intervention. Yeah. I, I think then the, the only point I'll leave with is I assume that this has been reviewed with REA and the teachers and, you know, that they were, they were part of the planning and all this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we uh, had schools opt into it. They had to volunteer. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we had to go and, and have question and answer sessions with them. Um, so absolutely, we needed to make sure that they had a hundred percent commitment to it to ensure sure. that our data was pure. And I don't, man, I don't want it to sound this way, but opt-in could be the principal said, "Oh yeah, let's go do this," and the <laughs> teachers were like, "Yeah," yeah. and we were asked. <laughs> so that's why I, I want to be very specific. Absolutely. We went out. It was really the entire the staff said, yes. "Yeah, this is a good idea." Yeah, they were and actually perfect. very encouraging and excited to be able to have the opportunity to pilot the program. Okay. They see, they see the foundational literacy as one of the gaps in, um, in the curriculum in general because uh, fourth and fifth grade students at you know, grade level instruction doesn't include that because the idea is that they'd already have it. So they okay. Have Thanks. Uh, Mr. Rollins. I just had questions about the timeline. If, if it turns out that you think that this has been a successful and you want to roll it out, I think I heard you say that schools were going to opt into this, that this was not going to be mandatory, that schools could decide to do this? It, the, well, the no, going forward. Going forward. Um, we're going to do what's a, so, a soft rollout. Um, because we are so late in the school year piloting it, um, having it mandatory to start the school year next year, um, I don't honestly believe that we would have enough days of training available to get every school on board and, and trained to the level that would be needed to make sure it was implemented with fidelity. So we're using kind of an opt-in early, uh, early adoption of the program. Um, so schools can, can select it as their intervention strategy for foundational literacy um, next fall, and then hopefully um, build on that and, and make it mandatory moving forward. And, and that was my concern, and maybe that addresses some of my concern, but it just looks like a really compressed timeline at the end of the year. So you're not going to really do an assessment, a final assessment, it looks like, until May. And then you're going to request, you have requests from buildings for soft rollout in June. The last day of school is May 28th. The teachers are gone at that point. Um, and you order the Reading Horizons materials for all elementary buildings, grades four and five, on July 1st. And we've had problems in this district before getting materials on time when we order them in the summer. And then secure the Elevate materials for staff being trained on August 1st and then train in August. Is that really going to work? Well, it's the hope that it would really, it will really work um, with this timeline uh, and only being able to pilot it second semester. I don't want to push something and then get the results back and, and have it not be uh, the great program that it's been sold to us to be. Um, I want to make sure it's something that's going to work for our students. Um, and I, I think that that is, is important. The most important piece to it really is making sure that it's working for our students. And then um, you know, from, from there, uh, all we can do is recommend that it's being used in the fall. It does crunch the timeline, I agree. We tried to, we, Deb and I tried to really hard to get this done um, so that this, they would be starting by November, uh, but with the uh, process of, of making sure that teachers were ready 
um, and getting the schools on board. That took us a little bit longer than we uh, had anticipated, so it pushed back the start a little bit. Another key to um, successful intervention is having time. Um, and so before we kind of go district-wide with this, we need to ensure that schools are ready because uh, the right intervention without the right amount of time dedicated to it will yield no result. Um, so it is certainly slower than what we had hoped. Probably we started this project last July, um, but we've thought of all of the long-term pieces and we felt that um, in this case it was better to slow down rather than to speed up. Um, there, is, there are sometimes complications when we order things on July 1st, not all the time, but we are working with a new process with finance where we can spend differently for instructional resources so that we can be outside of that July 1st timeline, so we can expedite that um, beyond July 1st. And then throughout the trial, we'll be communicating with the schools who are actually implementing the program and getting those in real time lessons learned about what's working and what's not so that we can be communicating to elementary principals so they can be planning in advance um, and kind of stoking their interest for the program prior to the end of June. And also one of the things that's nice um, with this being an intervention is you don't have to have it ready to roll out on the first day of school. You need some time at the beginning of the school year to identify your students who need an intervention anyhow. Um, so that gives us a little bit of a buffer at the start. And, and I agree with everything that's been said. I was more concerned that it looked like we were going to cram something through at the end of the year. And particularly with the, you know, the, the phrase in here about ordering materials for all elementary buildings in July, you know, I would hope that we'd only order for the buildings that have expressed interest and that are actually planning on using it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we budgeted for all because we're hoping it will be that good. Okay. Ms. McCullough? Well, and that was, you budgeted for, I, I, I'm going to be with Jaime on this one, Mr. Escobedo, and that is, you know, you've got a problem. I mean, you started out with, it, to me, it's an adult problem that we can't get something out into the schools in that period of time, um, you know, that we can't get the staff trained, especially if, the, if we don't have to start it right at the beginning of school. I would hate for us to order it for all the schools and then not be used. I, can you identify, you already said you'll identify schools who say they're interested, but it's a soft rollout. A soft rollout isn't necessarily all in, correct? Can I just interject on that? Um, so help me out with that. Yeah, I think that's an important board governance question, and, uh, and I really think it comes down to this. The, the soft rollout really, we are not absolving schools that choose not to participate in the soft rollout for accountability for improving their scores. If they, as a staff, don't prioritize putting the time in in the summer and being part of the pilot and engaging in the process and have other ideas in mind, we are not going to mandate that they, that we are certainly not going to purchase those materials, nor are we going to mandate that they do it. What we've learned the hard way in this district is those condensed timelines and missed training opportunities end up actually doing more damage than good in many cases. Uh, so we think it's important to continue to hold schools accountable for better results. Uh, this is going to be a great option. The training will be available. The resources will be available. And we will fully expect the schools that choose not to opt in to find other ways to meet the needs of their fourth and fifth grade students that are not meeting, that, that are below, significantly below grade level. My suspicion is if the pilot goes as well as we believe it will, uh, that will be the best advertising that we can possibly have for the program. But mandating it with this timeline uh, reinforces a lot of the negative feedback we get it, when I'm out in schools or when we look at our employee engagement survey, the idea of not listening and just kind of dumping things on schools. So I think this kind of splits that where the, uh, the resource, which is much needed, is there, but it is not mandated on that type of a timeline, um, I, I think is a really wise choice for the rollout. So that's why I supported it. So from a board governance question, I'm just saying I don't want to pay for materials that people aren't going to use. No, we because the board is responsible for the for that part of it, and and we'll trust you that right that you're putting it out as it need be, and again as successful and as much time as we spend going round and round about the first reading horizons and putting it out there with the whole, all the um, uh, the pilot and all the pieces. I mean, it, that was kind of it felt like a hard sell, although it's I don't know why that was because it has been a very um, well received and 
Well, and I'll say a lot of um, the success of that field test came from, you know, the intense scrutiny, really, from the board um, for having, I mean, it was a large expense, it was a large commitment, and, and our team really appreciated how seriously we, um, you know, as a team, really took that purchase. Um, and as a result, I think we've had a really successful rollout. Um, and so moving into Reading Horizons Elevate, we went back to Reading Horizons Discovery and replicated a lot of the practices that worked well with those trial schools, which included the making the commitment meeting, which meant not just the principal and not just some teachers. Um, everyone around the table had to look at each other and make the commitment to each other that they were all in so that we had clean data and we could make a really good decision for the district at, at the end. So what do you have budgeted for this for next year? You have budgeted for next year. Um, if it was every school. Just out of um, they sent us a quote that if it was every school, grades four and five, the total cost would be 429350 And if it was an intervention used for every school, 412, um, it's $540,200. So the difference between going from just four to fourth and fifth grade to um, being a literacy intervention for grades four through 12 is um, $120,000. But you're not piloting anything beyond fifth grade? Uh, no, not this year, but we would like to start looking at that for next year as well, especially as we start um, so rolling MTSS into the secondary schools a little bit more strategically. Sorry. Mr. Siegel, do I also understand that uh, Reading Horizons Elevate will be available outside of the Tier 2 and Tier 3 um, students uh, in the MTSS process? Yes. And about how many students do you anticipate are, who are just not in Tier 2 or Tier 3, who will take advantage of uh, this program? Well, we're hoping that any student who's re reading below grade level will. So even if it's just a smidge below. So those students who are not Tier 2 or Tier 3, the teacher doesn't really have to uh, initiate this MTSS process in order to get those students exposed to it? No. Okay. Um, I'm trying to, try to figure out the best way to word this. Uh, Dr. Jarrett kind of talked a little bit about the question that I have. So let's, let's say you have a elementary school who's got really low scores for reading for fourth and fifth graders or whatever and they choose not to be in the pilot. So then, then they have to come up with another plan for intervention and improving those scores and whatever. Are there other things that we know of now that you would accept in their plan? Or is it possible that you might not accept their plan and then you would steer them in another direction? So um, K-5, we have a literacy learning ladder that has interventions um, available um, for all sorts of different reading deficits. So anything that's done out of that interface, yeah, I'm sorry, that um, evidence-based learning ladder, um, okay. they could use. Okay. As long as it's evidence-based. All right. Any other questions or comments for Jen? Okay. Thank you. This will uh, return as an action item um, on our November 13th board meeting. The academic return on investment was pulled by administration, so our next is Dr. Kelly Munson reporting on employee engagement and the strategic update. So the employee engagement survey we are going to discuss tonight is high level, so that is one component of the survey. But I did want to note that on December 4th, our head researcher for K from K-12 Insight, um, the organization and company that facilitated the survey, will be here on site to give a comprehensive overview of the survey. Um, but actually, Dr. Jarrett is going to begin our presentation for the strategic update. So that December 4th is a committee of the whole? All right, come in. This is, 
this is an important uh, opportunity for us to do what I hope. We have six components of this meeting laid out that you can see. Uh, we're going to review our district trends, our school designations, which we've talked a lot more about. Uh, that, that isn't something we've talked much about. Uh, probably you have to go back seven or eight years to when school designations were a thing as part of No Child Left Behind, so we're going to spend a lot of time discussing that. Uh, employee engagement, uh, Dr. Munson is going to give a high-level overview. Advanced placement, uh, um, Stedman is going to talk quite a bit about that component of our work uh, in terms of how we're serving our high school students in advanced placement opportunities. The district scorecard uh, is something that I will be talking about. Dr. Riggett, Dr. Vosberg will be talking about the school designations. And our action plan is going to be embedded into this. And I'm actually going to start by kind of, we're going to do this a little bit in reverse order. I'm actually going to kind of start with number six and number five first. Uh, because I really think it's important that we end and begin with that idea of, yes, we're going to be looking backwards. Um, the, what happened in 1718 happened. Uh, our results aren't where we want them to be, and we're going to painstakingly walk you through those results and those trends. There are some bright spots, uh, but there are many areas of concern, and we're going to walk through all of that with you today. Um, but I really want to start with spending some time talking about what we are planning to do about it. We've been talking about the school scorecard for the district scorecard strategy for quite a while, and I want to really lay that action plan out for you as thoroughly as possible. Again, we've talked extensively about the idea of our district vision being the first choice for all families, and one audience is that, that we're, when we try to aspire to that language, and that's, very high, that's a very high ideal, um, we need to be moving forward, and parents, we, want, we ultimately want parents to choose our system for their students because they believe that is the best possible educational opportunity. And making academic progress in all of our schools is one of the best ways to ensure that that is the, that is the choice. And obviously we know we have work to do in that area, and so we're going to talk about what progress we're going to be making towards that specific audience. When we talk about this work, the district scorecard has two core functions. One is it really provides clear accountability, but accountability is only part of the equation. We do want to be very clear on what it means to be successful at the school level. But equally important is we want to show that that school success will only come if student goals are aligned with teacher goals, teams of teachers, and ultimately schools. So aligning that work is also very important as well. So it's one thing to have the very high level targets at every school, but also to align that work and to align our support. And that's where we get into the last piece, is autonomy. Uh, we have very closely started the process of diving into our survey data, and it greatly supports the idea that schools are open to this idea of accountability. They, there's need for alignment. But there's also a desire for autonomy and some differential funding when possible to support schools that need extra resources in a targeted way. So we're going to talk about what that might look like as well as reviewing our data today. If you look at our, th there's kind of a, a continuous loop in terms of how this lays out. And the scorecard is at the center of it. So I would ask that you'd start at the top. And having aligned goals around performance on the scorecard but the circle really gets completed by some new resource opportunities that are available. One of the positive things that really helps support this work is that along with the negatives that can come with the stigma of a state designation, additional resources over a multi-year commitment that in some cases will be over $100,000 a year that will go to the school level come through the Illinois Empower process. So that is the first box that provides additional autonomy and additional resources for our schools that need them. This, the next box is evidence-based funding. Now, what I mean by that, the state has provided evidence-based funding for our district to the tune of about $8.5 million over each of the last two years. And that's really exciting. Part of that investment has gone to support increased cost of business through collective bargaining agreements. Part of that money has gone towards 
tax relief. We've really made a multi-year commitment to supporting our taxpayers, and that's also part of our, our vision of being the first choice for families. But evidently, there, there will be additional resources, and we are going to do everything we can through this year's FY20 budgeting process, and I want you to be part of that and to hold us accountable for that, we are going to prioritize new dollars or dollars that we free up through other cost savings and discoveries in the budgeting process. We are going to expect that those dollars are driven into the schools so that they have differential resources. That will help fund things like the next box, innovation schools. We still have eight elementary schools that are in line for between 120 and $160,000 in differential resources in exchange for lengthening their school day, both as professionals as well as with students. And it's been exciting to see so many schools stay with that process. Evidence-based funding would also mean driving resources to schools that have a lower average FTE cost in terms of fund $10 spent. So for example, if a school had an average staff cost that was $65,000 per FTE, and another school was spending $50,000 per FTE, and is serving a needier student population, we will be looking at ways that we can drive additional dollars to the school that is spending less per FTE as a way to not only drive equity, but also to provide opportunities for autonomy and allow schools to, to make different and, and additional investments. So there's real resources behind our rhetoric here. The state and the federal government through Illinois Empower is providing resources. Evidence-based funding is state dollars that are being differentiated along with the innovation and we are ultimately trying to align and distribute those based on the need of the schools. So we will be really excited to go through that process with the board. Moving forward, that really gets into the autonomy piece, but going back to the purpose of the school scorecard, that really gets into the alignment and also the accountability purpose of our work. We do want to make sure resources are aligned, both financial, but also goals and strategies to making sure everything is oriented around getting better results for our students. And you can see what alignment looks like again. This illustrates what I've been saying over and over again, that the work really starts with individual teachers setting classroom goals with their students, driving that up to content area or grade level teams, school goals, and then ultimately driving that to district progress. When I say the scorecard is our strategy, it sounds really simple, but it isn't. Because that is about 28,000 students doing that work with their teachers. That is about almost 2,000 teachers doing that with an entire class full of students. That is around hundreds of grade level and content area teams of teachers doing that work. So when I say that is our strategy to align our, our efforts, that is a very important and very all-in kind of strategy. One thing that you saw differently this year is every single school in our district was required by October 15th to submit on sections four and five of the scorecard alignment from school goals to PLC goals or teams of teachers and ultimately their overall, their overall performance. Again, here you can see how that alignment goes from the inside out. Notice the student is at the center of this work. And that is very intentional. This is about 28,000 students hitting their growth targets and growing at a fast enough rate that they ultimately attain. Here's another way to look at how the scorecard lays out. You can see section one of the scorecard talks about achievement. So this is getting students over the bar and the overall learning environment. And growth is about growing to get over the bar. And again, you can see the engagement of faculty, staff, and students and parents as measured there. And then again, sections three through five are about those classroom, PLC, and school goals lining up. And here is where the accountability comes in. The state of Illinois has its designation system, and we've aligned our work to that. But we, like, we think ours is necessary because we can check it more frequently. The state system, for lack of a better term, is ultimately an autopsy. We are looking back in November right now for the first time that we can on how we did last year. We will not improve as a system if we rely on the state's accountability system because it is too late. 
you will see high levels of alignment in our scorecard system with the state, but we are able to look at leading indicators, that's, some of which change as frequently as weekly, but many of which change every 10 weeks, or every semester, or ultimately annually, but we don't have to wait for our metrics uh, until Halloween of the following year to be able to publicly talk about them. We can get those results in the hands of our teachers almost immediately. Uh, so that is really important. You can see that 70% of what we are going to hold our schools accountable for is how they drive growth and attainment through students. 20% of how we evaluate our schools will be based on the idea of, uh, excuse me, quality instruction. The climate and culture will be 20%, which is getting into, again, the, the parents, the students, the staff, the environment of the school. And then the final 10% goes to continuous improvement, which is where we will spend our time showing that alignment. So we actually decided to give our schools a little bit of credit for doing the alignment work of the, of the students to the teachers, to the PLCs, to the schools. So that is our strategy. We are really committed to making sure that we align our resources and our efforts around student goals. We are committed to accountability. It is very clear what it takes to be successful on our scorecard, and it is aligned to the state system as well, so I do not anticipate wide disconnect between state and school district designations. But again, we want that ability to make uh, immediate changes on the fly rather than waiting for a year. And then finally, we really are going to drive that autonomy. We want more resources and more freedom to go to our schools, whether it's how we spend our Title I and Illinois and Power Federal dollars uh, through a, a menu system that we're going to develop, or whether it is finding ways to drive additional state funding dollars to our neediest schools, or whether it is the process of supporting powerful concepts like the Innovation Zone that lets that let schools and faculty groups that are committed to doing more, giving them more resources. So all of that is our strategy as we support our schools, and we're committed to sharing every step of the way with you uh, through weekly updates, through this Committee of the Whole work and other board meetings as we get new data, and ultimately the budget process. You're going to see us find resources to drive into those schools moving forward. And now I'd like to ha hand this over to... This is Detman to really do a very detailed overview of how we performed last year in a number of key areas. We know that it isn't always the best news. There are some highlights that she's going to talk about, and we're excited to share this with the board and the community. Yeah, I would have brought it over to you. I was just finishing talking. <laughs> So as Dr. Jarrett mentioned, um, that's where we're going. Um, so I'll be taking us back on a journey in time to where we were um, last year. And as he also mentioned, this is really our first opportunity um, to be able to take that backwards look um, at our performance last year. Throughout the presentation, I'll be leading you right back to the root um, of the scorecard and so that we can see that alignment um, with statewide accountability and then our district accountability um, and how one connects to the other. So these are our, our data points for tonight. Um, first is PARC. Uh, next is dynamic learning maps. That's our alternative assessment that only a small number of students uh, take. SAT, graduation rate, on track, and eighth graders passing Algebra 1. These, this is the language right off of our district report card, uh, which shares our strategic goal. You've seen this before. Um, but we want to have the percentage of students who meet or exceed standards in both ELA and math to meet or exceed the state average. What you'll see in the following slides is that we have not hit that target yet. Um, we have had a downward decline since 2016 of 3% per year in ELA. The state has gone up and then remained flat, so not a whole lot of movement there. Um, and so that gap has continued to widen. In our alignment work with schools, we were focused on setting grade level goals for grade level instruction um, with an eye toward um, grade level rigor. Um, we are anticipating this year with that short cycle goal process that we'll start to see these numbers uh, creep in the opposite direction. In math, we've also gone down over three years by 3%, while the state, again, has remained relatively flat. 
And so again, that gap has widened. The next assessment is dynamic learning maps. Again, that's our, our alternative assessment. Our goal is the same, to meet or exceed the state average. We did see a modest uptick, uh, which really kind of took us right back to where we were in 2016, um, at 11% of our students in the composite score um, demonstrating proficiency. The state of Illinois um, did see an increase up to 22% this year. Our next data point is the SAT. The SAT is still relatively new uh, to our schools and to our teachers and families. Um, previously, as you'll recall, we were focused on the ACT. The SAT benchmarks from the state of Illinois, it's important to note, are set higher than the national average. The state of Illinois has ERW and math, both set at 540. ERW stands for Evidence-Based Reading and Writing. It's our English score. Um, and nationally, the benchmarks are 480 and 530. I think that is important to note. The state saw a decline of about 3% in evidence-based reading and writing, and our district saw a decline of about 4% in evidence-based reading and writing the last year. In math, uh, we dropped 4%, while the state dropped 3%. So there was a downward trend statewide, not unique to our district. Um, the SAT is a different assessment than the ACT. Um, there is a learning curve for everyone, I would say um, families, teachers, and students. Um, we've already devoted uh, several days of training to this. Um, most notably, we had Asa Gordon from the College Board join us um, and present to all of our high school staff on October 3rd. Um, and we'll be developing uh, continual professional learning around the assessment and how to align short cycle goals at the classroom level to the assessment. Our next data point is graduation rate. Our goal here is 87%. Uh, we set that goal based on last year's state uh, graduation rate, which was 87. You'll see that the state has gone down slightly. And we, want, we are measuring this by a four year co cohort. In these slides, I'm going to show you both our district rate and then also our school rates because the way that they are calculated are not the same. Our district rate includes all students, including those who are outplaced for various reasons, therapeutic day, ILC, etc. And so our, state, our district rate is 65%, which is 2% decline from last year. The state also saw a 2% decline from last year. However, we have some bright spots in our district that I'd like to pull out and celebrate. Jefferson High School um, did not see a decline, and in fact, since 2016 has seen a, a significant uptick. So they're uh, resting at 76% with a narrower margin um, to catch up to the state. Guilford High School has seen uh, gradual increases as well, and this year um, is boasting 81%. That puts them at only a 4% gap from the state. But just as we have celebrations, we also have areas of concern. Um, and we can see that at East, we did see a modest uptick um, to 68%, um, but that's still far below where we'd prefer to be. And at Auburn High School, we did see a decrease of 3%. The big question, though, is not just monitoring uh, if our students are graduating on time, but how we know all along their journey that they've been on track from the beginning. And so on our school scorecard, we have two key metrics. Um, that help us to keep track of this. One of them is um, watching students' RIT scores, or Ready for Instruction uh, Today scores, um, and we want them at, at a minimum at the 50th percentile. And our goal is that 87% of students would achieve the 50th percentile as measured by each of those individual indicators, second through fifth grade. We also are looking in middle and high school at the percentage of students who are on track which means they've earned in high school uh, 12 semester credits with no more than one semester F in a core course. And we'd like to see that number carry through at 87%. The state, of course, does not report on root scores. We report on those locally, but the state does report on freshman on track rates. 
And our freshman on track rates did see a dip last year of 2% while the state remained flat. We have uh, a range for our schools from 59.5% um, up to 77.2% depending on the school, but our district average is 64. On our internal scorecard, another metric that we're using to um, ensure college and career readiness is a uh, number of students passing Algebra 2 or Integrated Math 3 as we roll that out with a C or higher. We think that's important um, for college and career readiness. We want to be watching that students are getting that upper level of math, that they're able to avoid remediation, or that as they get into Integrated Math 3, we're identifying which students need a transitional experience from secondary to post-secondary. The state of Illinois, however, reports earlier on a metric, which is the number of eighth graders passing Algebra 1. These are students who are more advanced. Generally speaking, you take Algebra 1 or Integrated Math 1 your freshman year. So this is an early indicator of advanced math. And we did see a nice, we've seen a nice progression from 2016 of 21% to 2018 of 28%. We're within 3% of the state average. So that's where we've been uh, with our data, which, um, you know, the word is autopsy. The question is, what are we doing? And how are we supporting high quality instruction in every classroom? Um, last year when I gave this report, Mr. Rollins, you said, that's lovely, can you get it in under 600 words and give me the top three mm -hmm. items? And I told you three things. I said that we needed to put a focus on grade level rigorous instruction for every student, that we needed to put a focus on short cycle goal setting toward growth, and that we needed to put a focus on high quality instruction. We have identified um, several areas of opportunity where we can use adult supports to come in from the side and support instruction in every classroom, and those are listed on the slide here. The first year, uh, near and dear to all of you, we've talked about these a lot, are the multi-classroom leaders, which gives some of our most effective teachers the ability to impact more kids and then also have job-embedded, high-quality training for their colleagues in terms of having a peer network, a strong PLC. The second thing that we did is we completely, um, what's the right word I'm looking for? Uh, eliminated, I guess, um, our reading specialist positions throughout the district because they were being used in various ways across the district, not all of them with an eye toward instruction, with a lot of time with, with teachers and with students. And so we eliminated that position and in its place have instructional coaches. Those instructional coaches are held centrally from our continuous improvement department. And we've repurposed that position really as a deployment mechanism um, to support Smart in the Classroom or PDSA in the Classroom, also known as short cycle goal setting. So we've identified these areas of need and we're creating the adult positions that can come in and help um, to deploy that work. The third thing um, is supporting that high quality instruction through um, the aligned curriculum, the five year plan. Well, des well designed curriculum is fantastic, but it doesn't mean much if it's not being implemented. And what we identified is with our kind of archaic structure of the department chair and not having an instructional support at the middle school, we could not guarantee consistent deployment. And so we, again, took a look at our positions, took a look at our resources, and kind of wiped the, wiped the slate clean and realigned them. So now in grades six through 12, we have um, what are called curriculum implementation leaders. And these are teachers who are teaching five classes, but they also receive a differential. They are meant to really be the PLC leader in the building by course. So this year, we rolled out new freshman curriculum in Global Studies, Integrated Math 1, English 9, and Biology. Each of those subjects in each of our schools has a curriculum implementation leader. These uh, differentials were uh, co-hired by the principal and the curriculum dean. They receive intensive training. They're also the place where the message of alignment and goal setting gets deployed. They're also the place where they're going to be going into each other's classroom to do some observation. 
they're the classroom where we take some risks with innovation and other people can come in and watch. So we've taken um, you know, the concept of aligned curriculum and pushed that deployment down to the teacher level. Um, we're only in you know, month three of this, but we're hearing some really good feedback. I'm hearing from principals that they have started making their curriculum, curriculum implementation leaders kind of their um, instructional brain trust in the school, which is fantastic. And then finally, I mentioned in our last report, the professional learning community, or PLC, system alignment, and that we engaged in a system check. And as a team, we analyzed you know, about 500 goals district-wide, um, examined some themes, and provided professional learning for our principals. We just met with our principals again today who gave us very good guidance um, and wisdom on what they need next to be successful and keep that alignment going throughout the year. So I think looking at our data is important, um, both growth the last time I shared with you and then also our attainment. Um, but the biggest question is how are we responding? Good evening. Now we're to the part of the presentation where you can learn about the state of Illinois and the support and accountability that they're going to provide through the school designation system. This is a new uh, system for the state of Illinois. Uh, you may recall years ago a thing called No Child Left Behind, and that was a, a federal uh, program um, that was linked to our Title I money and linked to accountability for schools all over the country, but that was federal, federal guidance around accountability and performance. Um, it took some time to reauthorize that and it evolved into this form of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which provides the states a lot more flexibility. So we, it's, uh, it's different than No Child Left Behind, it's a little more complex, but it did provide each state with their own uh, flexibility to create plans to build accountability systems and support systems for schools in their states. So I'm going to go over um, the designations. There's four designations. You may have been aware of this already. Exemplary, commendable, underperforming, lowest performing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the funding mechanisms that are provided with those designations. First, let's talk a little bit about how schools earn their designations. These pie charts represent the uh, distribution of scores that are used to create an index. And the index um, is sorted and ranked. And that um, will put you in your categories for state ranking uh, in the four categories I just mentioned. We're happy that, um, as you can see, growth is a, is a major component to the index for K-8. We're happy about that because we think as educators, all kids can grow and we can uh, move kids uh, from where they're at to where they want to be or where we think they can grow to. And we have some um, work there with our map data to show that we, we do make progress with growth. Um, one, of the, one of the downsides of the growth metric in, in the designations is you can have a really high performing school, like some of our, our, our gifted academy, and um, it's really hard to grow when you're already at the top. And that would in, impact how you would be uh, ranked as far as the state is concerned. A new category, and it's, it's, it's a major one for us, is the chronic absenteeism. You can see K-8, it's 20% of the scorecard. And our, our data that we've received thus far shows that we are above the state average in chronic absenteeism, so we have some work to do there. Uh, the 912 band, uh, again, highlighting the, the big pieces here, graduation rate is a, is a big piece of the work. And uh, we know we have some work to do there as well. Here are, the, here are the four categories and the definitions. Just a quick overview. Tier 1 means you're in the top 10% of the state. You don't have any subgroups that are underperforming. Tier 2 means you're commendable, which means you um, don't have any subgroups that are below the, um, the lowest 5% of overall school scores. And you have a graduate, if you're high school, you have a graduation rate of at least 67%. Tier 3 uh, is, is a designation of underperforming, and you would have subgroups that are considered in the lowest 5% of Title I schools, and um, that's, we have some schools in that category. And then lowest performing, again, based on the index that I just showed you, the pie chart they used to calculate the index, uh, if you're in the bottom 5% of the state on the index, then you'd, you'd be in the lowest performing category. 
here's the breakdown of where our, our district and where our schools are designated at this point. Here's the actual schools in each category. So here's our tier two schools that are commendable. The asterisk and double asterisk designates the funding, which I'll get to in a minute. There's a slide that would better explain that, uh, the funding that the state's providing to support those schools. Here's a look at our tier three schools. and our tier four schools. The work that we do now, based on those designations, and we just received final designations last week, is to um, build a plan for improvement, and this is a needs assessment that we'll do uh, with, su with support from the state. Our lowest performing schools are ass assigned a school support manager from the state of Illinois to help, help them to create a plan, I'm sorry, to create their needs assessment to develop a plan that the board will vote on in February, at the end of February. February uh, 28th is, is, by, is our approval date. I'm not sure the last meeting in February is, but we have to have it voted on by the board before that last, uh, before February 28th. So uh, that's what you'll see coming up. Uh, the hard work between now and then will be schools, the principals and their, and their leadership team of teachers We'll develop and work on the needs, uh, the needs assessment, and then after that's submitted at the end of January, develop an actual plan that will guide them for the next three years. So uh, on the previous slide, you saw the asterisks and double asterisks. This is, this is how the money is uh, dis distributed. We had schools that were uh, identified in the summer, and, and those are preliminary designations, so, so they can get, depending on their category, fifteen to $50,000 dollars this year. And we have some schools, then, then summative designations come out in October, and that could add funding. So we have schools that are going to receive $15,000, and we have some schools that are going to receive $150,000 to help them with the work this year around um, planning and school improvement efforts. That money flows through their Title I budgets, by the way. Here's the timeline, as I, I kind of just overviewed for you. This is our planning year, and all of our schools are going to indicate that with the ISB by November, November 15th. And then we work on the, the state's call it the quality framework and supporting rubric, which is really a needs assessment. I think we're fortunate. Most of our schools have done a QPR, quality peer review. I think some of the board members have attended those. So we've, we've been spending time with our state um, school support manager to crosswalk the findings in our QPRs to align with what the state's looking for. And there's a lot of carryover, so we don't have to duplicate efforts there. Um, so that work will be submitted by January 31st. Then we have a really quick turnaround for our schools to submit their final plan for uh, approval by the board, probably the last board meeting in February, and then to the state by February 28th. Final step is amending the work plan and monitoring progress on a monthly and quarterly basis. Next again, as I said earlier, we're going to do a brief and broad overview of our employee engagement survey. As I said, on December 4th at the Committee of the Whole, Dr. David Blakelock from K-12 Insight will join us and give a comprehensive view on the report and the correlations and implications of our results. So today I want to talk through four categories. We want to review again the continuous improvement cycle that was established and followed through last year that we're implementing again this year. The timeline for support to monitor our action based on the results of the employee engagement survey. To look at some district trends from last year to this year, since this is our second year giving the employee engagement survey to all of our employees. And then talk about some district actions for focus. This is the same process that we established last year and we found success in truly validating the feedback from our employees. Again, as you recall, this is the one survey that we give to all of our employees across our organization. So individuals across our organization have the opportunity to truly reflect and respond on all of the categories within the employee engagement survey. 
In addition, schools had the opportunity to respond to a portion of the survey that was co-created by K-12 Insight and our REA and members of our union that established additional questions that are specific to our specific school at our PS205. The first portion is normed, so when Dr. Blakelock joins us in December, he'll talk about how we um, did based on the norm on the benchmark that's created in the survey. Our timeline has already begun. So the survey has been conducted, we have our results, and starting this morning we have already met, we're starting to meet with principals to walk through a specific pro pro process. The process includes looking at our data, disaggregating the data and looking at our trends, and then creating an opportunity for improvement based on the recommendations in the survey and utilizing that information to create a gap analysis to determine the root cause of why we believe this is occurring, and then create an action plan, an action, an action steps that we can act upon immediately. And then this year, we're gonna do one thing that's different, which is at the end of the cycle, around March, we're going to give a brief survey to review how we've done. It's going to have actually um, 11 questions, which will again give us an idea on did we make improvements in this school year based on our action plan? And that will give us a summary of our engagement scores for our schools. So how did we do? So the district response rate is provided here and it gives the two year trend. So green represents this year, and the blue represents last year. So you can see based on our response rate by role, we made significant improvements in some areas and a bit of a decline just in response rate in others. But our overall engagement is stagnant. It is exactly the same as last year as far as highly engaged, engaged, and less engaged. So our numbers didn't change. Different portions of the survey shows improvements or decline, but overall our engagement is stagnant. So we're gonna talk about that as we go through the year on how do we increase engagement. As you recall, we really wanted to see a minimum of a 3% increase this year, and that we did not hit. We are also slightly below the benchmark for districts of a similar size with similar demographics. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So engagement by role was also fairly stagnant, but you'll see a decrease in particular areas, which I'm going to highlight in some future slides. Last year, we focused on our district data, and with the help of K-12 Insight, we identified three areas that we had lower scores in, especially when compared to the norm or the benchmark, but also areas that had a high correlation to engagement. So areas that if we were to change across our organization, the perception in these areas, we would increase engagement across the organization. So the three areas we focused on were district leaders understand my professional needs, District leaders' actions are consistent with their words, and district leaders encourage employees to share ideas to improve performance. And you'll see that we did make a, a small increase in all of these areas, but we really had anticipated making a larger increase. But some things that we did do last year that we found successful were things like rounding. Dr. Jarrett was able to visit schools and ask specific questions to really focus the feedback to bring back to drive change. And we did that rounding also throughout cabinet. So we all rounded with our teams and rounded with individuals across the organization. We also started a values rollout last year and we are continuing this year here at the district office to really focus on expected behaviors across our organization. Um, there's a couple other things that we've done that we are going to continue to do and some things that we're going to alter. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the slides. Overall, there were some positive trends that we saw. So an increase in, I feel appreciated for my work. The district encourages continuing education and professional growth. And I work in an atmosphere where there is mutual respect among staff. So these were areas across our organization that we made an increase from last year. Other positive trends were district staff and school employees communicate well with each other. And my PLC is a valuable use of our time. And again, that specific question was just referenced from schools. But we also saw a, decle a decrease in some of our areas. So these are areas that we still have opportunities for improvement. Specifically, one area that we started to address this morning with elementary principals is the percentage of building administrators who are engaged or highly engaged. And also, I am proud to work at this school. These are areas that decreased. 
And I will state that in addition to the comprehensive report that we received from K-12 Insight, there is also one open-ended question, and they do a synthesis of all of the results. So Ms. Detman and I have already taken the time to read through these results, um, and the open-ended questions um, yielded 107 pages of very valuable specific feedback. And so we've categorized that feedback into some categories, and we'll be taking a deeper dive at Cabinet. And at this point, Cabinet has already had two retreats where we've reflected on this information, we've really disaggregated the data, and we've begun to action plan. And the next part is going to be looking at this specific data, all 107 pages, um, to really take a deeper dive on what can we do differently to increase engagement across our organization. Overall, staff, again, was stagnant. And I will state, I actually asked the researcher to rerun the statistics since I found it fascinating that we made zero change. And he did run it for me, and it is truly stagnant. Um, but there are other areas, when you look at the trends of individuals and where engagement falls, you tend to see a trend, and we'll talk more specifically about this on December 4th. But usually, as teachers enter the field, there is a higher level of engagement. And it seems to taper off in the middle of sort of their tenure, and then towards the end as they enter um, the age of retirement, that engagement seems to increase. But we had a specific area of decrease for individuals who are here in the district between 11 and 15 years. So that's also an area that we want to reflect on. There's another area that we want to talk about, and Dr. Jarrett has already referenced this in other conversations, and that's the concept of a net promoter score. And the net promoter score is basically a series of two questions that are asked within the survey. And it's the confidence level of individuals in recommending their school and recommending our district to others. And I listed the specific questions, and it's basically on the scale of are you most likely or not likely or least likely to promote your school and to promote the district. And it's calculated this way. So they take the percentage of detractors from the promoters and it gives a value between positive 100 to negative 100. That basically means that positive 100 means everybody in the organization is actively promoting the district and or the school. Negative 100 would be the opposite, that no one in the organization is promoting the school or district. From this survey, our school net promoter score is eight meaning the average of schools that are promoting the school that they work in is at eight. And again, that's on a scale from positive 100 to negative 100. The district net promoter score is negative 29, which means there are more detractors than promoters. Now, we did a school range and looked at the analysis of all of our schools. And the individuals who sit in their schools, their rate or their, their NPS or their net promoter score of really meaning would I promote the school in which I work from schools ranged from positive 87 to negative 80, and the district perception from the schools or the district promotion from the schools ranged from positive 16 to negative 76. So this is an area we are also going to emphasize and focus on. We're going to ask K-12 Insight to do a deeper correlation. Um, they've already given us some statistics, but they're going to speak to some correlations as to why this is particularly important. One thing I can share is that there is a correlation between increasing engagement in promoting your school and district. So this is an important area for us to focus on because to be the first choice for all families, we need to have confidence that the individuals that work here are promoting our schools and are promoting our district. So we're going to continue to talk about that and we've emphasized that as one of our areas of focus. So after we took time to really look at our, at our survey and after we really had some very fierce discussions, we've landed on these three areas to focus. Again, the first two are the same as last year because we want to see a greater increase in district leaders understand my professional needs and district leaders' actions are consistent with their words. The third area that we want to emphasize too, and we don't have trend data because this is the first time we've asked the question, but the net promoter score. What can we do to increase the internal confidence of employees in, within our organization? So these are the three areas that we've chosen to focus on and we've already begun our action plan. We want to value and validate the voice of our district. People took the time to complete the survey. They've given us valuable feedback and a lot of it. So we want to start our action plan now. This is our first look at our action plan. As we really desegregate the data deeper, we will add items to the action plan to ensure that we are conscientious about the voice of our schools. But one thing we're going to continue to do, because we've seen success, is rounding. And Dr. Jarrett has shifted his rounding. He will now focus on the questions back on the 
the, focused on these three questions. But he's also separated his roundings. So when he goes to school, he spends time again with the whole staff, as he's done in the past. But now he also spends time one-on-one -on -one with the principal, and he spends time in the classroom so that he can truly get a feel and sense for all of the cultures of our schools. In addition, we're action planning. The action plan that I showed you is something we took schools through. We've also made a collective commitment to do the same action planning process within our districts. Um, so across our departments in the district, we're going to also action plan to ensure that we're identifying an area to grow and action planning for change. We also want to look at the way we determine what our professional development opportunities are. So we're going to invite more of a collective feedback from the teachers to ensure that we're hearing their voice as to what they need and what they want for professional development opportunities. And principal support. We're making a concerted effort to work collectively with all of the members of cabinet to ensure that when we support principals, it's through one unified voice and that we are working together to ensure that we are supporting them with the vision um, through the scorecard, but also meeting their needs and being consistent and speaking at walking the walk and talking the talk. So those are some areas we're doing. So again, we're following the cycle of continuous improvement to ensure that we're truly being loyal to the feedback that has been given to us and we are taking action based on that data to drive change in the organization based on our feedback. Thank you. So I'll round us out here with um, a last metric from the state report card, but I, I, saved, I separated this one because I wanted to dig a little bit deeper than what the state report card gives us. Um, so we'll look first at what is reported on the report card, and then we'll look at what we have been tracking internally. We'll look at the number of students enrolled in AP, the number of AP tests taken, and the number of AP tests passed with a score of three or higher. So what the state gives us is kind of an, an aggregate number. When you look at, for example, the, the third row down, total AP exams taken, and you follow that all the way across and you look under grade 12, you can see that there were 2,134 exams taken. Well, that's a cumulative number of all the students in 12th grade and all the assessments that they took in their high school careers. And it's not really very easy to compare ourselves to the state. This is really just a static number. But over the last several years, we've had it as um, a core focus for us to increase access to AP. And so what I've provided here are our internal numbers um, organized by ethnicity, um, African American, Hispanic or Latino, and white. And what you can see is, I, I took us all the way back to 2011. That from 2011 to 2019, we've had a significant increase um, in our access overall. And what I did not include on the slide, but I do have here in my notes, are the percentages. So for our African American students, we saw an increase of 61.9%. For our Hispanic or Latino students, an increase of more than 200% in access. And then for our white students, um, an increase of 57%. But we want to know more than just the number of students who are opting into an AP experience. We also want to know if they are taking the assessments. And then beyond that, we want to know if they're passing the assessments with a score of three or higher, which would give them that credit then in post, their post-secondary experience. The number of AP tests taken uh, has increased most dramatically for our Hispanic or Latino students, <coughs> with again, uh, nearly a 200% increase. We saw a much more, much more modest gain um, for African American students with only 7%. And that makes us ask the question, uh, why not? Why take the test and not the assessment? I think that's really important for us to dig into uh, school by school. And um, then with our, our white students, we saw an increase of about 52.5% in the number of tests taken. It's also important for us to look at the, those tests that scored um, a three or higher, which would again give them credit um, at a state university or college. And while we've increased our numbers rather significantly since 2011, the percentage of students, uh, I'm sorry, the percentage of assessments that scored a three or five saw only a slight decline. But it's also important to look beyond the percentage and look at the number of tests taken and the number of tests that scored a three or four, three, four, or five. So 
So in 2011, we had a total of 590 exams meet that threshold of a minimum of a score three. And in 2018, we had 978 exams meet that minimum threshold. So this is a, an, it's been an area of focus for us. We've partnered with Equal Opportunity Schools. We've been um, out uh, looking for the students that have the potential, are ready for the challenge and the rigor. We've used the state AP grant for the last several years to provide additional training to teachers, um, tutoring hours for teachers as well. And um, for a few summers did run a, a boot camp support for students as well. Um, so these numbers are really promising for us. Um, and uh, especially for our Hispanic and Latino students, their access and success in AP is um, pretty dramatically demonstrable in these charts. And so I'll, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Jarrett to close us out. I know we are anxious to get to some Q&A and some dialogue, so I'll wrap us up quickly. Again, accountability, alignment, and autonomy. We talked about the importance of our scorecard providing both accountability and alignment and autonomy being available through additional resources. Again, we talked about the fact that those funding streams are going to be available and walk through what those would look like. We talked about the alignment between school uh, students all the way up to teachers, to teams, all the way through schools and driving our district results. And ultimately, the scorecard being very clear about what success looks like and very closely aligned to the state scorecard. We talked about the specific examples of, res of resources. And the last new slide I'll share with you is just a reminder. Um, we do spend a fair amount per student, but the state of Illinois has also been very clear uh, and something it's, it needed to do a long time ago. They started looking not at what you spend, but looking at what you should be spending in order to, based on evidence, meet the needs of your students. And Rockford, the Rockford Public Schools are at 61% financial capacity right now, which puts us in the bottom of four tiers. Now, the good news is the state is committed to addressing that through the budget process. The bad news is some, that's something that we're going to have to closely monitor every single year in the state budgeting process because there are so many competing interests for those dollars. To get a sense of what 61% means in real dollars, it means there's a delta between $213 million in terms of available financial resources and the adequacy target of $351 million. That is what we should be spending. And to put that in perspective, the range in the state, there are some school districts that are as low as 48% adequacy prior to the intervention of the two years of funding. And there are some schools that are as high as 280% funded. So the state of Illinois is prioritizing tier one districts like RPS. We have used those resources to fund tax relief for our community and are prioritizing in the budget cycle, driving those dollars to schools moving forward. So I just wanted to provide that. This is not an excuse for our performance, but one of the things we do have to be aware of is in the state of Illinois, for far too long, your zip code has determined the resource level that you have. And so we have a huge opportunity with these additional resources to both better balance property and state income tax revenues so that the local property tax uh, payer bears a lower burden while simultaneously driving additional resources to our schools and more importantly to our students who need it the most. And with that, we will open it up for questions. I know there's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> I want to thank our team for all the hard work and preparation they put in, and we are here to discuss this as long as needed. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Mr. Escalado, you get to uh, go first. Can we, uh, this is painful, but can we look at a slide number 30, actually 20, what? 13. You can start asking the question while I get it. How far does the park go back? I mean, year one. The park goes back to 2014. 2015, I apologize. At least on the website, they only go to 15. 2015, correct? That's when the switch happened from ISAT to Park. Okay. So starting in 2015, I think they had something like 29% uh, readiness. Okay. And uh, every year or a year has been consistently one trend. Um, 
finances, demographics, I'm assuming for the most part have stayed consistent. So my question is, what is the root cause at a high level? Some of the, what what is the reason? What is the root cause? The three A's: alignment, accountability, and not having enough autonomy in our schools, and that is what we're setting out to address. By the way, the 29 to 23, we didn't include that because that was a paper pencil test. It was not apples to apples. It was, I don't think it's a fair comparison year over year. 2016 is when we started doing the computer-based test. We fully own those drops from 20 to 17. I don't think it's fair to compare students that are taking a paper pencil to students that are taking a computer. It's much more difficult. Uh, and we saw And we saw that trend statewide, plus it was the first year of implementation. So I think we can fairly own the, the 23 to 17% drop. I would dispute the 29% was accurate in terms of uh, paper and pencil while most of the rest of the state was taking computer. So we had a disproportionate advantage. So I do appreciate you pointing that out, but that was intentional that we left it out from an apples to apples comparison perspective. But uh, the root cause is we have schools that I don't think have had clear enough targets so that's the, the need for the scorecard and the alignment, and that there hasn't been enough alignment between student growth and the ultimate attainment that is needed, and the resource distribution needs to flow to the schools. Remember, most of these new dollars from the state came far after any of this work occurred. Most of it came after the, the second round of testing. Virtually none of the $17 million in new funding came prior to the PROC testing, so none of those dollars were available at that point. This was all um, this was all during budget failed budget cycles and things like that, and so I do think we have a unique opportunity to drive additional autonomy and resources to our schools. But I don't think we've been clear enough. I don't think we've been aligned enough, and I don't think there have been enough resources distributed to the schools. And we're going to address all three of those this year, and we do believe that we will see uh, improvement. Uh, we are we are fully committed to delivering that. Yeah, I guess, you know, I've been on the board for three years, and every time we turn around, um, there's a great new initiative, a great new program, a lot of great, fantastic presentations, uh, a lot of good um, district educational jargon, but I, we still don't see it translate to educational achievement. So that continues to be, from my perspective, um, a continued concern, and every time I... That's why I cringe every time I hear something about, well, we're going to take this slow and make sure we're implement, implement in, in a right manner. But at the same time, from my perspective as a parent is, we're out of time. We don't have time. It's no longer a uh, sense of urgency. We're in a state of emergency. Um, so that I'll, I'll try to limit my comments on that one forward, but I mean, I've said that enough. The other question I had was with, uh, so you started touching on um, AP courses. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about rigor. Um, what, can you tell me a little bit of correlation uh, as far as uh, student grades on AP courses versus um, what they're passing for the state or to get credit? Um, so we have started looking at the classroom grade versus the score on the exam. Um, it is not as systematic as an intentional, probably, as it, as it could be at this point in time. Um, but we have started looking, looking at that and the correlation between the two. Um, and, and Matt has led some of this work in schools over the last few years to look at classroom grades um, in our state performance, um, calling it really the rigor index to look and ask the question, are we teaching rigorously enough? And um, the grades that we provide to students, is it signaling their readiness for the next level? I just add a little bit to that. Um, it is a conversation that the principals have had the last couple of years with teachers around um, what, is it, what does a grade mean in your class? And should that grade, uh, if it's an A or B, should that grade equal three, four, or five on the test? The AP exam. So we do um, run a correlation and, and sort the data and have those conversations with teachers. Um, I do think um, as a school system, 
it's really important that when you tell somebody that they're ready, that they, they're truly ready. And so if you're telling somebody uh, they're doing A-level work uh, in a course uh, that's college um, rigor, that they should be able to pass a test. So, and what's the correlation right now when we look at those? You know, I, I'll have to go back and get, I can get that information for you. I don't, I don't have it memorized. It's not as good as I'd like it to be, that's for sure. And I guess it's just not just for um, AP courses, right? But we've got the same thing in uh, regular classes as well as honor classes. I mean, if what's the regular level? What, um, you know, we've, had to, we've heard concerns about um, students in, in regular classes who are not able to, should, should probably not be in that class because they, um, they're not ready. Um, so just in general, I mean, I guess that's a general concern across all uh, is the rigor and student readiness for, for those. Right. <clears throat> you, can look, you can look at our map data and our state assessments and know that, um, that there's not a strong correlation between that and a grade distribution. So it's, um, it's a challenge at the classroom level to make sure uh, that we have high expectations for students and that... Um, I think it goes back to the alignment piece that we're actually teaching what we're going to get credit for on an AP exam or on a state exam and uh, that grades should reflect that kind of work and uh, it's not where we'd like it to be at this point. I'll, I'll add to that, um, that a big part of the conversation is grading and scoring practices in every classroom. Um, and so throughout our curriculum design process we've started with the question what should students know and be able to do? Um, and in the work that we're doing in assessments and assessment bank items aligned with each of those learning targets, which basically just means how am I going to measure what these students were supposed to learn, um, we're ensuring that we're creating scales that show exactly what it should look like when students are performing at grade level and that then the grade corresponds with that performance. That's been disjointed in the past and that's not unique to our district. Um, it's really called standards, um, standards aligned grading. Um, and it's, it's a different way to score and grade. And we've been embedding that in our curriculum design process. But as you know, some of those curricula are new this year or have just hit last year. Um, and so changing grading practices, asking those critical questions, um, it takes time. As a teacher, I can remember it taking uh, me quite a while to wrap my head around how I used to grade and what those grades meant and what it means now that I'm truly looking at grade level rigor um, and understanding. So it's not a direct answer to your question, but what I can tell you is it's embedded in the design work and then therefore embedded in the implementation work. And then, yeah, one last question, okay. um, and I'll be done. Uh, going back to the root cause, um, so, you know, and I'm just from industry, so when you have a problem, right, and you sit in a consistent problem, the first thing you do is you analyze the issue, you find the root cause, you implement a corrective, a, a containment action to say immediately we have this issue, it's not going to expand, we have a containment plan, and then a corrective action. I guess what I'm trying to understand is from the root cause is, root cause for the continued decline in standardized test scores, when did we analyze, when did we look back and um, try to figure out what the root cause or root causes were? How long ago, or what, has, it, has that been continuous? I'm, honestly, from my perspective, I'm just trying to understand is um, all these years and one thing is consistent is the down downtrend. So when did we look at the root cause? We look at the root cause when we built a comprehensive employee engagement survey process from the ground up so we could understand the root cause. We looked at the root cause when we rebuilt failing data systems that didn't provide accurate assessment data so we knew how things were going. We've looked at the root cause when we dramatically increased our investment in early childhood. We looked at the root cause when we saw that not enough students 
had access to advanced placement courses and we drove that very high. One, so we've looked at the root cause uh, very, very introspectively uh, as we had another decline in PARC and SAT scores and uneven improvement in graduation rates. We are constantly looking at the root cause as a system. And I think at the end of the day, Mr. Escobedo, I think the, the root cause analysis ultimately has to make sure that we, that we build a strong enough culture in our system that that root cause analysis is happening in every classroom with every student and in every school. And I think we have tended to try to drive too much of that centrally. So I, it has not been a lack of analysis or a lack of problem solving or a lack of commitment to improvement, but I do think that that improvement has not driven consistently throughout the system well enough. And so I think that is where our commitment has been with this strategy, is to make sure we are very clear that what is expected at all levels of the organization. And it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to build a system to, to support it. So that is what has been occurring. So I can tell you that in the, in the eight years I've been part of this organization, um, there are a lot of things that we're proud of. I completely dismiss your notion that it's all negative and that things have gone backwards. Our AP ex results, our, uh, our number of students passing algebra are two examples that we presented today. But I completely support your notion that it's unacceptable to have multiple years uh, of decline on the state standardized test. So we are, continued to commi we are continued in our commitment to drive better results uh, throughout the system and I think we've been very clear tonight about what we intend to do about it and I believe we have gotten to that root cause and that is that that alignment is not there and I don't think that accountability is felt at all levels of the organization the way it needs to be and I don't think there's been enough autonomy on how they spend their resources so with that increased accountability will come increased autonomy and increased expectation of alignment. And it's not just a catchphrase, it's something that we feel really strongly about. I have a couple. Um, what, what do you, I don't know, maybe Heidi, this is to you. What do you, you know, the board would get, will get comments from the community about, well, maybe we should be teaching more to the test. You've probably heard that. Um, what would you advise us to say? Keep going. Is that one of your questions? <laughs> no, no, it just takes me 15 minutes oh, to get my yeah, yeah, turn sorry, so I'm just starting right. now. Okay, all right, okay. The so so microphones are always okay. good for comic relief. So, uh, yeah, I mean, because we hear from teachers that that's not the, what we want to do. Right. But the community is saying, okay, with bad test scores, maybe you should be doing that. So here's the thing about the new assessments. When you're teaching to the test, you're teaching skills. Because the new assessments are aligned to skills. Um, previously, kind of our old generation of assessments were really designed around content knowledge, um, memorization, rote uh, recitation of facts, that kind of thing. The new assessments and the new standards launched in 2010 and then again with the NGSS and then again just last year with the C3 framework for social studies um, and our national core arts standards really demand a heck of a lot more of our students and they demand more along performance. Um, so I would say, yes, we should teach to the test because the test is, is actually asking students to tackle complex problems and complex text um, from various different ways, um, and they've not seen these problems or texts before. So they have to deploy strategies of critical thinking um, and problem solving in order to do well. And so, yes, we actually want to be teaching them those skills all the way through the school year. Sure. That's been one of the major shifts in our kind of next generation of standards since 2010. All right, next one is a comment that I didn't catch before tonight, and that is five out of six of our middle schools are in tier four, which is not good, and the other middle school is in tier three. So to me, that shines a light. Mm -hmm. We got a problem in our middle schools. We do, um, and so when you go backwards on the test, because, because it's indexed on growth, that's going to be a major uh, factor in your rating. So um, that, was, that was a surprise to the middle school principals and myself mm -hmm. to see that. Um, again, um, they all went backwards one or two points on the park, and, or even three. So uh, we know what we need to do next year. They, They've uh, had a call to action 
quite frankly, they, they're, they, they've been heavily invested on the map in the last two years, right. and uh, which I think has, has done a lot of good things for uh, goal setting at the classroom level. The teachers and students really own the data. Um, I was at Kennedy this year when they took the map. Kids take the test, and as soon as they hit the last question, a uh, score pops up. They know exactly what they did, and they're recognized, they were recognized at an assembly later that day. So there's a lot of relevance to the map, and so that's been driving the work. But we know that to get credit for our work, we have to do better in the park. So they, they've um, had two meetings already. They have a, a model called SOAR to four, because you need a four, okay. uh, which means you need to be at the 75th percentile, a four on the park to be meets. And uh, they've had a couple of meetings already, and they're gonna share out that work with all of our principals in a couple of weeks here. So I'm, I'm confident that they're not going to stay in those categories for next, for, for next year, but uh, they do have some work to do. Okay. My last one is, why when we saw increases in AP activity, did we not see a higher graduation rate? Shouldn't there be a correlation between more kids taking AP stuff and more kids graduating? Shouldn't that be going in the same direction? or? Am I misunderstanding? No, I, that's a great question, um, and not one that I have a back pocket okay. answer okay. to or notes <laughs> in my notebook about. Um, but I think it'd be really interesting to look at the schools that saw an increase in graduation and look at how our increase in access to AP is maybe distributed across our schools. That would be one way that I would approach answering that okay. question. Um, and then I also might look at um, our 10th and 11th grade students who are currently in AP and how we distribute that as well. Um, so I don't have that readily available, okay. but that's it a great question. It seems like that would just make sense to me. Quick, um, okay. I agree with Heidi on that. I, I would also add, you may recall, um, since you've been on the board as long as I've been here, we did um, eliminate a lot of honors classes that duplicated the AP work. And so, uh, so those are our honors kids. Those kids are going to graduate high school. Mm -hmm. So I'd say a lot of the kids in honors were on track to graduate. I do think the push to AP definitely impacts the overall culture of the school. Um, but the freshman on track is our prior biggest predictor graduation rate. Okay, all right. Mr. Lawless. So I, I've been at this a little longer than Mr. Escobedo. I've been at it almost eight years, as, as has Mr. Scribano and Mrs. McCulloch. I think you're approaching 10 years. Yep. And I thought we'd be at a different place by now, um, which is frustrating. Um, when I got on the board, this was a really well-performing organization with a lot of problems, and I think that we've spent a lot of time making it a better performing organization. And part of that is getting better people in the administration, and this may not always come across, but I actually, I'll say it publicly, I think we've got the best administration that the Rockford Public Schools have had the entire time I lived in Rockford. Um, that's why I'm so frustrated to see these results and not just year after year and not just on the park. I mean, you didn't hide them. I mean, you went through most of these, but you can go to the school report card and see we're, we've been stalled out for four years on every major indication. Park, well, SAT, we've only got two years of data, graduation rate, freshman on track. Uh, you know, I understand there's this weird issue with the graduation rate. We can't figure out why our district-wide graduation rate doesn't correlate to our high school graduation rate. But the reality is our district-wide graduation rate is being reported at 65%. Um, when I first got involved, somebody who probably regrets saying this told me that the easy part would be getting us to the state on the graduation rate to, to the state average, and the hard work would start then. We're at 65%. 65% for our graduation rate. And we were at 68% in 2014. And I'm not going to say you're doing something wrong. We're doing something wrong. We are doing something wrong. And we've got to figure it out. And I don't have a magic wand I can wave. I don't have anything to tell you other than I think we ought to be in listening mode. I think we ought to be asking people. Um, I think we should be asking people in the trenches what ideas they've got. And I think we ought to listen to the answers that they give us. Um, you know, if you read the paper on Sunday, sure, we can talk about 
the adequacy of funding, and we can talk about our students, but the surrounding school districts are certainly doing better than we are, other than Freeport. Um, some of those districts have a lot of the same issues we have. There's something we're not doing right, and we've got to figure it out. And this, you know, this shouldn't drive anything, and uh, hopefully it won't drive anything, but I just want to point out you've got three board seats up for election this spring. Two years from now, it'll be four, a majority of the board. And two years after that, because of redistricting, all seven board seats will be up at once. And if these are the results that we're showing the community, that could clearly have an impact on those elections. I, I really hope somebody can figure out how to move these numbers this year in a way that doesn't involve reducing rigor. Ms. McCall. At the very onset of this, there was a comment about a deadline for, was it goal setting for the schools, Heidi? Was that October 15th? There was a couple. Uh, one was for submitting PLC goals. Uh, and then there was a there's a separate deadline in our evaluation cycle for submitting uh, individual teacher goals. And so, how did we do hitting those percentages or hitting those? In terms of goals submitted, sure, we did a great job. We had uh, representation from every single school across the across the district. Um, so we had a really it gave us the opportunity to have a full environmental scan of our goal setting across the district. Well, that's good to hear. I'm just thinking back to the 10-day mm -hmm. count and the percentage of schools that actually put their numbers in for that and you know, where the priorities are. And, yes. And, um, no, we, um, and if they're not engaged in giving you what you need for you to give the feedback, um, so that's not, that's not no, a problem. No, we, we had plenty to work with um, and, and look at. It is interesting on the APs that the 10th uh, graders had a 52% pass rate. The 11th graders had like a 39.6, and the 12th graders had a 41%. So, you know, it's, I don't know what the difference is. Are they more excited about their first round and first year of taking those AP classes? Also, do we have a percentage, uh, national percentage, on AP pass rates for our exams? I don't write the second, but there is one. It's by, by subject area. Well, we didn't get it by yes. subject area. We kind no. of just had the big 40% number here. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious how we compare. I, how much below it? <laughs> I, haven't done, I haven't done that level of analysis yet okay. by test. And you had said RIT was like ready for instruction, but then RASHIT unit is there. I, could, you, could you please help me? And it's, it is for anybody who needs to page 26. What, tell me what it is again. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm blanking on that. For I don't, I'm not understanding. Slide 26. Yeah, it was 26 I wrote down. <laughs> Ready for instruction today. Is that what that stood for? Well, it says rash unit also on here. I don't know what that is. Rush unit is the way that they calculate. It's the calculation behind the scenes on how they determine what a RIT score is. Okay, so. A coincidental acronym. So, what is the score of 88, 188, or higher mean on a RIT score? What should it be? Fifth grade, 211. So, the, I, I, to those me, RIT scores represent the 50th percentile at that grade level. Okay, so second grade, it would be 188, third grade. Correct. Still don't understand what a RIT score is. I'm so there's the, the calculated unit, and then there's kind of the layman's ready for instruction today. Um, and all of our RIT scores are um, kind of laid across what's called a learning continuum. And so it will tell you when you pull your teacher report, if you have students who are scoring at 188, these are the skills that they can do. These are the skills that they need some more support on. And actually, the SAT does something really similar um, called Skills Insight. So you can correlate a student's score with the skills that they're uh, struggling with, the skills they can master today, and the skills that are coming up for them in the future. So I'm going to go to a place that <clears throat> probably 
I don't know, sometimes things are left better unsaid, but at the end of the day, it's our teachers who are doing the teaching in the classroom. And we keep talking about the fact that are we not giving them the right tools? Are we not, what, what are we doing wrong at this level that the board is, what are we doing wrong? What are you doing wrong as an administration? What, what is it we haven't figured out? Um, but is that, is it all, is the onus all on us, I guess? I mean, we, how, it's not just what we've given tools. I just heard you say on the whole piece about the, the Reading Horizons Elevate, for example. We can't rush them. Um, you know, we've got to bring it in slow. We've got to, you know, engage. We've got, but if teachers are not getting the outcomes, and I understand the scorecard is going to help us with that so that there's some accountability, but if teachers aren't getting the outcomes um, that we'd like to see with their students, um, and I'm glad that we have that accountability, how much has to be, you know, this is like the hovering parent on the helicopter where we have to help them do everything. At some point, we should be just empowering teachers um, and have teachers prepared. Are they not prepared coming out of schools? Are they not, I mean, I just, I, I really think, and, and I, I'm probably gonna be blasted for this, but I think that our teachers need to really take some responsibility. Um, and I'm as disappointed, I'm just more disappointed than everybody else because I keep seeing, you know, ENI and REI and this and this and that, all these, all these different um, ways that we're going to improve instruction, we're going to change the curriculum. And as you've stated, it's, we haven't seen the increases that we'd like to see. We were told that, it, again, who just said, um, more AP courses taken, more student, we should see a better graduation rate. Um, I think you guys did tell us that in the beginning when we changed that. I understand the, the honors, I, I heard that. And we have a lot more students taking the tests. Dr. Jared just pointed that out to me as well. Um, but my frustration is, is that, um, is that I don't know how we, how, other than the accountability through the scorecard so that people can see um, where their students are successful or not, how, how do we get our teachers to be invested so that they really can move the students or, or, instead of just keep finding new things to do or, or new ways or? So I think, I think we've talked about a little bit tonight with the PLC model, I think the, the peer support model has, has been proven to be effective when they're aligned and, and targeted in the right areas. But I do want to take an opportunity to highlight something that that we we, uh, we talk about probably too much, but we do have a really good system to support our teachers. Our power program, it's, it's prob there's only three districts in the state that have that. And I think, um, so ad addressing um, teacher performance and giving them support, I think we do have a really good system for that. And we have, in three years, work with approximately 80 teachers to get better and get stronger. Uh, we do have, um, in the state of Illinois, a teacher shortage. And so uh, we are finding um, that um, some schools are struggling to fill vacancies, and that does impact the work. Because, uh, As you said, it's in the classroom, and it's led by the teacher. So uh, we've, we've uh, worked, in your, your part of those conversations at DLT. We believe in collaboration with the union and the REA. And it, it takes time because um, teachers have the ability to have a lot of autonomy in their work and creating ownership around the results and the work um, does, does take time. And teachers work harder, I think. This is just an I statement having been around and, and watched them for leaders in their schools who they really respect and peers who they want to work well for because they want, they are a team and they appreciate um, that that approach, but um, I, I, I just I don't know I don't know how we can get less adult focused and we are, and more student focused. That I think that that is the key, and I, I don't know the answer. Just like we don't have the answer on all the pieces. So thank you for letting me take that, Mr. Siegel. I've only been on the board for less than three years, 
but I'm going to use that newness as a credential because um, I'm going to go through some things that have come up just in my time being on the board. We have gone from having a Title I formula that really penalized our most effective use of paying for personnel to one that allows us to really economize on how we're going to pay staff so we don't have to just spend Title I dollars on stuff in order to feel like we got our best value. We have watched our classroom climate steadily improve. Expulsion, suspensions, arrests are down more than 60% since 2011. We have watched the community's economy go from the worst in the state to not the worst in the state. It's still not super fantastic, but it's a whole lot better than it was. We've gone through a bargaining process with all seven of our uh, labor partners in the time that I've been on the board. This is just a tiny portion of all the many, many variables that I think weigh on performance um, for, our, for our students. To ask what the root cause is, is a little bit like asking, well, which snowflake moved that caused the avalanche? It's, they all did, and if we're going to really solve all of these problems, or solve our achievement problem, I think we need to ask, can we really tackle all of these problems that weigh heavily on achievement? Sure, we can you know, point to teachers, we can point to administrators, we can point to the board and think, Jude, you ask a fantastic question. What can we do? In fact, I think all the stakeholders involved should make that their primary question instead of saying, well, what do they need to do? And what, what do we do? What can we do? And I think we need to depend upon an administration who sits and looks at this very closely and I think with tremendous, tremendous interest and earnestness and let them guide us as to what what we need to do. As far as comparing 205 to our surrounding districts, yeah, look at Belvedere, North Boone, Honanega, Harlem, Freeport, and look at how many high schools do, does each one have? And I also look at demographics and wonder how much does homogeneity play into the difference between their achievement and ours. Without a great barrier in culture between the instructor and the student, I think that there are efficiencies that they realize that we don't. And if there is a fear that our families are going to flee 205 for these surrounding districts, how long do you think it's going to be before we break their achievement? How long is it going to be before their schools are suddenly at a capacity where they need to look for a new school, they need to start spending dollars? The dollars that we have spent on a facilities master plan over the last 10 years? Um, you know, these are all things that I, I, I think have driven our, or have made achievement a, a challenge. But I also hear, heard tonight a number of things that I think are going to successfully address a lot of these problems. When I see that there's going to be Reading Horizons Elevate made available to more students without having to go through an MTSS process. I, if, if I were a teacher, I think I would be pretty excited about that. Getting more of my students access to this intervention 
without having to go through the MTSS process, I think there's you know, tremendous upside there. We have just approved some assistive technologies that also are, sounds like they're going to be used by more and more of our students. We are working with Ericsson, I presume, that they're going to tackle age zero through third grade. And we now have something that we hope that we can apply to grades four through 12. There have been a ton of variables that have weighed heavily on achievement. But in the short time that I've been on the board, we have introduced, started, and even fully deployed things that haven't been able to bear their fullest fruits yet. I think Rockford has had some unique challenges. And 205 certainly has. But I also think that uh, this administration has done a lot of things that we just haven't talked about that I think are likely to affect a positive outcome in our, our achievement. I know in the tradition of the Pollyannic one on the board, um, but I do truly believe that we are at a point where you know, the, the scores people are going to talk about are terrible. But are we going to talk about, instead of what happened, what went wrong, are we going to talk about what are we actually already doing? What are we doing now and what are we going to do? And I think that seems to have been part of the conversation that didn't get e enough attention to that. That's my eight cent worth. Mr. Connor, are you next? Um, mostly I've got questions. First is, um, this is a, a substantial um, pulling together of a lot of data and so forth. Um, one of my questions is, um, we used to go through this on our Saturday sessions, and I know I've talked to Mr. Scrivano about this. Is this the kind of thing that is worthwhile and I know we set a schedule for a lot of good reasons, but it, it seems like it might be worthwhile digging in depth uh, on a dedicated time for something like this. So I'm not saying that we go out and change that, but that would be one of the suggestions is, you know, do we need, and I can't remember when we hit our last one, to be honest, but the point is something like this, it seems to me, would deserve really dedicated time and I'm just speaking for myself um, you know given you know the work schedule it would be good if <laughs> we had time set aside just for this I'm just that's one comment um, a few questions for you um, one is on slide 41 where it talks about the funding for the underperforming lowest performing and so forth and what I heard was that this was done through Title I. And what I'm wondering is for the charter schools, um, are we the intermediary for their Title I? Or will the state look at this and that goes directly to those charter schools? I think I can answer that. Um, there are actually two federal funding sources. One is Title I. Um, and charter schools already get those dollars that flow through there. This is, these are specific Illinois Empower dollars that flow to schools that are in the third or the fourth level of performance. So those are actual federal dollars as well. So they, I think they will function very similarly to Title, school, title I dollars in the sense that they are federal and, and that they will, it will be important that these do not supplant uh, District Fund 10 resources and state resources that are spent to support our schools, so we'll have to make sure we do that. But this really comes down to you put a plan together, and we our goal is to make sure that there's as much flexibility as possible, as much clarity as possible in terms of delivering those dollars to the schools. So what will happen is that they'll get these dollars on top of their title dollars um, in terms of new resources. Do we actually administer that, or is that done by the state? We 
we will technically it will go through the L and Power. We help administer it, but largely the state um, provides those resources directly to the school. I think is the way that it functions. We can bring Dr. Wolf in to dive into the mechanics of it, but um, if you take a typical school um, that is in that fourth funding level. They'll receive $100,000 this year during the fiscal year, and they will also receive $100,000 in the next fiscal year, and they will have to de devise a plan to spend those dollars. There is a person from the state that helps administer that, but that one person, I think, has to support 13 or 14 schools at this point. So obviously, the district will need to provide opportunities uh, and support for the schools as well. Anything anybody on the team would want to add to that? I would just also add that the schools in Tier 4, part of the funds have to, that it is required that they spend them towards a partner um, that has been identified and approved at the state level. So based on the approved learning partners, we can choose from that list based on the areas. Or the charter school? We will. So we will work with the schools that are identified and okay. based on the results of the self-assessment, that will denote an area that they can choose a learning partner from who will come into the district and support those specific schools. Okay. So in a sense, if I can put it this way, there are strings attached and the charter schools have to follow the process, Correct. which is the standard process. Okay. Um, on a different sort of set of questions, as I look through the tiers, the, the one thing, and maybe you have done this and I missed it, but when uh, Mr. Escobedo asked um, part of the question on the root cause, I think one of the things that strikes me is that typically when you have an issue, even if you think it's irrelevant, you take all the data points around it. And so one of the things I'm wondering is, do we go by all the various schools and ask ourselves, what's their attendance, what's their engagement scores, uh, what's their funding, you know, because we don't know clearly all the correlation data points. And as I was reading through this and all the factors, it was one of my questions is, you know, do we have something like that where we look and I apologize being a data guy, but the dimensional views, meaning the vectors yeah. on each one of these is do we do that because I would wonder if our results have been down, do we have correlations, say they go back three years, that we could do by school that are consistent enough that might paint some kind of picture that, you know, staffing levels, uh, class size, and, you know, there's probably bunches of things that we could do. And so I'm wondering if, is that something that is, exists? To, to support the, the need for that, I, I think that I could speculate, because we've certainly done some of that, but I think in fairness to Mr. Escobedo's question and your follow-up question, I think additional work is needed. I can tell you that in general terms, we are already, even though the data is relatively new, mm -hmm. seeing very strong trends that faculty engagement and net promoter score do seem to, there, there do seem to be some relationships there. And tr um, there, there are other relationships that we'll explore as well as we get more sophisticated with our work. But um, the, the, there, I think there is a real opportunity to do more of that analysis with survey data um, and some of the other work that we're doing. Anything anyone else would want to add on that? Dr. Mutson or? Is yeah, that, that was the purpose of the scorecard is yeah, to ensure, yeah, although yeah. we've been looking at data in isolation over the past several years since, you know, we instituted our, um, uh, really back in 2014 when we started gathering our data to create our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, but we really need to refine that and as you just stated, get all of the data in one place and do a school analysis so we can see the correlations. Right. And so that was really solely the purpose well, of the scorecard. And, and if I might say so, um, right, wrong, or different, if we are being looked at comparatively either to a standard score or you know state scores or whatever it is, you know, and I, I doubt we have the same data for all that, but at least some comparatives, some trending, some real statistics on this, you know, standard deviations, blah, blah, blah. I really think that would help. I'm just speaking personally because then I could see all the factors, if you will, around one of those and how they trend. And then you could take 
that I know, and I really like this from Mrs. Dedman, that the idea of the quintiles, I mean, but whatever that standard is, that, from my point of view, would be truly helpful. And, and I think there are some big questions in this, and you know, I'll pick on attendance rate and funding, and uh, there's all kinds of things, class size, that you hear about. And so I'd be very curious to know how each one of those that you hear anecdotally about and how that relates um, to me that that would uh, tell, really tell the story. And I know we have our decision ad and we have other factors now that we can more easily pull those in. Um, and I would think um, demographics, you know, even the boundaries, you know, who knows? So that would be one suggestion on this. The other thing I'll say is that in addition to the suggestion about really coming up with a Saturday time, um, this is a phenomenal amount of work, and I know I appreciate the, um, the effort and uh, the wherewithal behind this, and it shows from my standpoint that we're really starting to think along the lines that we can A, communicate, and B, track in a very systemic way. So from that standpoint, this is a real step forward, and I commend everybody for the, the work. And frankly, I think even the board comments, the one thing I'll say to the, again, the three people that are out there, hi, how are you, is that... Um, they went to bed. They went to bed, yeah, I think we're smart, yeah, it's 8 o'clock. Um, <laughs> Uh, or they're watching election results or doing okay. that whatever. I, I think the point is that um, there is an engagement that I am actually happy to see. And uh, if I contrast it with, I've been on uh, five and a half years, I really think both the tone of the board, the tone of the conversations, and the focus is so much better. So I would say that the work reflects that, but the commentary truly reflects that. And so what I'd say to the public is that this is an engaged group and whatever else you might say, there's a lot of good things, there's a lot of good thinking. Um, and, and I really, and I'll be very specific and say to the unions and to uh, teachers and all is that, you know, you might complain about this entire process, but the fact is that there's a lot of people who care deeply about this, and I think that's reflected in this. So I commend really, uh, you know, my peer group, the administration, the leadership of, say, the teachers, and so forth, for being engaged and really appreciate. Okay, Ms. McCulk, I think you're next. <sighs> David, all students are can learn. They can all be taught. Absolutely. They we've can. had a shift, but I, I mean, we've, we've all gotten the book, we've all read. I mean, all students can be taught. That can't be an excuse. We can't have an excuse. Our teachers can't have an excuse. Not saying they should. Matt, 80 teachers through PAR. PAR is a great program. How many teachers do we have? Maybe 2,000-ish? 80 teachers in how many years? Three years? Yeah, three years. Okay. So it's interesting in an organization to think that of the um, frontline people mm -hmm. that we've had so few how many, how many that have needed this? to come through. We, many, we actually many, budgeted for more. We haven't filled all the right. seats. In your, in your first five years on the board, or first no, seven years on the board, how many did you have? It's movement, and I appreciate that. And, and I do not want to negate the positive. It was a great presentation. I think that we have the right people at the table looking. I think it took a period of time to get the right people together at a cabinet level. We went through some changes. In, um, but I don't think any board member got on the board thinking, oh, I want us to do worse. And I don't think any superintendent came in <laughs> no. thinking, oh, you know, I don't really care if the scores goes down, just pay me and I'll be here every day. I really think people are in these jobs or in these volunteer positions because we're dedicated to education and improving the education, especially in the Rockford community. So um, yes, there's improvements, and, and I, would, I had hoped that the whole change in climate 
would make a difference, but what I'm hearing is at the elementary levels, there's still a lot of social emotional issues. Maybe this additional money, this funding that we have isn't, you know, maybe achievement isn't all about just initiatives for the educational part, but how do we get the kids focused? How do we help the teachers um, to keep the kids focused and to not distract from the other students in the room and their learning environment? Um, when I say, you know, when I talk about teachers, um, I see them as professionals and I want to support them, but I don't want to hear that there's a teacher shortage, so we're just lucky to have the rooms filled, the classrooms filled. Um, if, it, if it gets to that, we're in real trouble because we're already in real trouble. So, and I do think um, we not only have had flight of, of students from the district, we've had a flight, I know specific teachers who have left the district because they don't have um, the environment that they want. I, I, and sometimes it's they don't have the students that they want to teach. And, and, you know, God bless them, they should go somewhere where there's the students that they want to teach because we need teachers who want to teach our students. And they're out there. And hopefully they can bring their peers um, up uh, into that same level of excitement. So um, I, I'm telling you, David, there's been initiatives Every year in the last 10 years I've been here, and every time it's going to be the, the holy grail. It's going to be the silver bullet. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. And again, it's, it's not the initiatives. It's the people who are taking that information, taking those strategies, taking those pieces that they're being given, and how are, how are they implementing them in the classroom? And are we helping them by having a good classroom um, space for them to do that? So um, I just, I really believe we can do it. it it's just frustrating that we haven't. Um, one piece on the, the four categories, because I don't think anybody has really elucidated this. I, I know I asked the question privately, but we have um, our gifted program, Marshall, I think the middle school came out like one of the top schools in the entire state, and yet it doesn't even make the top tier. So I think that's indicative of um, there's a whole lot of information going in here that, I, why? So somebody, I know Thomas isn't here, he can't explain all the multipliers and, uh, <laughs> uh, but, Travis. or Travis, Travis yeah, okay. I've yeah. been here a long time, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I first knew him. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so Travis um, may or may not be able to explain that, but it says a lot to these tiers when our gifted program that is one of the top performing programs in the state with, is in the second tier. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Dixon, I think you're next. Um, I guess I have more of a statement to say than anything, is that, um, you know, I try to listen to the community and uh, go to different events uh, just to hear. and. We've, as a board, we have made a firm uh, commitment to achieving the gap. We have put pressure on the superintendent and the cabinets. And because of that, the cabinets put pressure on the administrators. Ministers have put pressure on the teachers. So I've heard from different teachers that, that there's too much pressure. And my response was, we have no results. And so, um, and I, that, that's not a takeaway from anybody, but at the end of the day, if I, if I never get reelected, I want to know that what, why I'm here counted. And so I think the board is, we want results. And I think the administrator, everybody wants results. And so we're pushing towards that. Um, and so, yeah, it is going to be pressure. Anytime you change or trying to grow, it's going to be pressure. It's going to be of times that it's not comfortable. Anytime you work out, I'm trying to lose a little weight. It might not look like it, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, so, and as we go through these stages, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I think we have the right process. I think we have the right um, ingredients. Um, but um, I really give a lot of credit to Heidi. Um, even when I talked to the community, I, I said, I wish she was, she was in her position a couple of years earlier. I think we probably wouldn't have had this process, but we, I, I, we wouldn't be where we're at now. But I think we'd be farther along. But at this time, this is where we're at. Um, we need to, you know, keep at it. Um, and we can't give up the pressure. I mean, we can't give up the peer pressure, because the, there is going to be uproar. 
Um, it's just a matter of time. It's from my colleagues that I spoke to, there are communities upset, and they have every right to be upset because we have went back over the last three years. And so um, at times I'm impatient, I'm frustrated, and all of us are, but let's, let's keep at it. I think the conversations that we have have um, um, that they are they are accomplished um, what we're trying to do, and I just want to say that um, it's not it, it's not going to be easy. But we can't give up. The board we have to keep pushing for it. That's all, uh, and uh, and just keep keep putting the pressure. Okay, Mr. Rollins. Yeah, well, I think I'm going to echo something that Mrs. McCulloch probably already said, but, the, but just to reiterate, Mr. Siegel, just so you understand, some of us have sat through eight years of earnest administrators telling us if we do this, if we do this, years-long discussions about leading indicators versus lag ind indicators, at some point, there have to be results. And that, that was the only point that I was making, which is at some point, the community is going to hold us all accountable. And that means showing results. We can have all the great discussions, wonderful discussions, great plans, all the discussions about leading indicators we want, but at some point, we have to have results. Or if it's not us holding you accountable, it's going to be somebody else sitting up here holding you accountable, because um, that's just the way things work. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, if, if you, I hear good things going on right now. I do. It's, I, I, try, I tried to make that clear at the beginning. Maybe I didn't make it clear enough. The best thing I hear is the, the teachers, some teachers, hopefully a critical mass of teachers, are buying into the goal setting. They're buying into the short cycle goal setting um, for the first time ever, probably. So you've got some group of teachers who are actually interested, engaged, they're using the map, they like the map. Um, if I have any advice at all for you, it's try to figure out what's working, what you think is working, and double down on it, and try to figure out what's not working and stop doing it. Um, that's all I can tell you. Um, and I'm not sure we're doing that, really, to be honest. I'll, the, the reason I'm saying that is I'm not sure we're doing that. I'm not sure we sit around and say, hey, this looks like it's working. What can we do to support that? What can we do to build on it? What can we do to emphasize it? What can we do to expand it? Hey, this doesn't seem to be producing much in the way of results. Maybe we need to cut that loose. So that's, that's my advice for the night. I do see some bright spots. I, I just, I don't think this is, can be a three to five year process, is what I'm trying to tell you. It needs, the long term stuff that we're talking about, I love it. I think we're doing the right things. I think we're having the right conversations. And I don't want to see us stop doing any of that. But I do think there needs to be, somebody needs to be thinking about short term things. What can we do this year to move the needle? And then the same thing next year. What can we do to move the needle on a day-to-day -day basis, week-to-week -week basis, month-to-month -month basis? And if I have any sort of observation, I think that we have not done enough of that in this district, that we have been too focused on the long-term, three- to five-year strategic plans. You know, here's a great plan that will produce results in three to five years, all of which is great, all of which needs to be done. And I think maybe we need to be doing a little more of the down in the trenches, day-to-day, -day, dirty work of how do we increase the park scores, how do we increase the freshman and track score rates at each high school, how do we increase the graduation rates at each, high, at each high school, and trying to figure out what this difference is between the district-wide graduation rate and the high school graduation rates. If you do the math, if you look at our high school graduation rates, we should have a district-wide graduation rate of about 73%, which would look a lot different. And yet, the state can't seem to explain to us why our graduation rate is 65%. So that's a state-level issue. I just, I wish, I really wish somebody could figure that out. Mr. Siegel. I'm not going to wage a war for anything, but we, if anyone on the board was expecting to that when they voted for an initiative that that was a silver bullet, that was silly. And there is no silver bullet. And we need 
we need a Gatling gun full <laughs> of silver bullets. And we need, we need a lot of silver bullets. And frankly, our problems aren't all stationary. Our, our problems are, are moving targets. And as far as um, you know, initiative after initiative after initiative being deployed and not seeing any results, I would disagree. I'm, we are seeing results, results that are not desirable, so hopefully we're not repeating the same initiative over and over and over. We keep trying new initiatives. Now, it's been my observation that in the not quite three years I've been on the board, in calendar year 2018, it's really been at that point where this board has decided that closing the achievement gap is our torch and pitchfork. And we have really started going after it, really, really going after it on a, with a, a lot of intentionality, making it part of every conversation. And this, think this committee of the whole format is really helpful for this. Um, so I guess I'm going to go back to June's question. What is it that we can do? Is that a question that this board has asked? Is it a question that anybody has asked? Is it a question that everybody has asked? And I think it's really important that we start asking that question, not is it, what is it that the whoever can do, what is it that we can do? Um, I, I don't know, I, it's, I, I guess I don't have the drag of a lot of experience of watching things come up and fail, come up and fail, come up and fail. What I have seen are new initiatives in three years that have come up, and each initiative takes time. I mean, the, the Are Your Teacher Pathway is an initiative that has gotten traction just in my short time on the board. We won't see results of that for years. But it's still a really great initiative, I believe. And you know, these are, are just, I, I just think we're overlooking things that are, are, are being tried. Because things that we were trying didn't work. But just expecting that there's going to be any silver bullet, I don't think that's reasonable. Mr. Escobedo. So I said I was done, but. Okay. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I, yeah, and I apologize. I didn't mean to sound negative um, or take credit for a lot of good things that happened in, in this district. So my apology if I came out the wrong way. Unfortunately, as a parent, I have a different perspective, right? I have a different sense of urgency. Um, at the same time, I've mentioned, said this before, you know, at the end of the day, my kids will be fine. We'll figure out a way. But what about every other kid in the district? What about all those kids that, you know, are single parent? What about all those kids that don't have parents looking out for them? Uh, we've talked a lot about years here, you know, two, four, eight, ten years that we've been on the board. One single year, our seniors will be out of the district. So we're done. We're done with them. Right. In four years, you know, they're it's starting out now we've, we've lost them. What I'm getting to is when we keep talking about years down the road, this is significant time that our kids, we're, we're losing time. We don't have another three, five, ten years. We don't have the time. We're out of time. The state that we're in, we're completely out of time. Um, so I guess, you know, just a couple other things. When we talk about Saturday retreats, um, I mean, I don't mean to be negative, but we've had enough Saturday retreats. I think it's time that we let administration do their job. Uh, we've set our expectations and go from them. Uh, I, I apologize, Mr. Connor, but I, I, have a different take there because I completely remember where we were on the last Saturday retreat 
And we were talking about scorecards that was going to take four years, three years. Um, last point here is, in industry, when you have a product that is failing, you have all decks on hand, right? Everyone. When, you have, when you're in a state of emergency, you're every, every hand on deck. Everything that you can do, you will do day after day, week after week. If that means weekends, if that means people getting on a flight tonight, if that means you're going to ship you know, 10 of your best engineers out to whatever, all hands on deck when you're in a state of emergency. Why? Because at the end of the day, come next year or come next contract, there is no other contract. And it's not one individual, it's a whole company that suffers, right? It's hundreds of people that could be laid off. All I'm getting to is that we're in a state of emergency, and I hope, um, as Mr. Rollins, Ms. McCulloch mentioned, is that uh, we figure out and we find a way to make a significant turnaround this year. I, I, it's a critical year. Okay. Um, I'm just going to kind of wrap up and just make some observations on my part. One, I truly believe that solutions um, just can't come from the top down. I'm going to kind of jump on one of the things that Tim mentioned. And I, I really think we, uh, you know, maybe in the engagement survey, <laughs> We should have asked a you know a, a question about what do you think we can do to improve test scores or something. I mean, I think we need to ask our employees what they think we can do. Um, and I I would say maybe we are asking that, I mean, and or, or maybe we we're asking faculty meeting. Yeah, yeah, you know what you know, that kind of thing. And, and maybe there's something out there, and it's not going to be one thing. It's going to be m multiple things or whatever. And it might be different for one teacher versus another teacher, even in the same school, you know what I mean? Yeah, that, I mean, so I think that's a good, I think that's an, uh, an opportunity. And I would say, um, coming from a large organization, um, I think what we're talking about is what we're trying to do as a board and administrative team together is change the culture of this organization. And, um, one that centers the students um, first. And um, we got a ways to go yet, and that is going to take time. And I'm sorry that that's reality. Uh, cultural change, in or I mean, there are tons of textbooks written on how long it takes to change an organization's culture. But that doesn't mean you give up. You can't quit. You, and we still. Um, as I said to the media, our students and our community deserve better. They deserve better from this board. They des deserve better from this district. And so we got to figure it out, and we've got to change that culture and put our kids first and make, make them the, and their success the most important thing. So. Okay. Are we done? Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, I just want to... No, I'm going to ask a question. Okay, sure. So I just said off mic, um, we have a process called Quality Peer Review. They're going into the schools. They are talking to teachers, and they're looking at correlation with scores and how schools are doing. Um, there must be some information, some from the ground up suggestions that you're getting out of that. We don't hear anything. We don't get reports from about quality peer review. I know that there's some concern about um, people being, you know, the honesty versus the autonomy. They don't want to talk if they don't think that if things are going to be shared. We don't want to throw any school under the bus because one school's doing better than another. Is that what we do in industry, Mr. Escobedo? <laughs> Escobedo, I'm sorry. Um, I think we learn from the people who are doing well instead of saying we don't want to put somebody under the bus who's not doing well. We want to really focus on the people who are doing well and, and, and learn from that. So. From Mr. Rollins' standpoint, uh, or, or comment about ground up, aren't we getting information from there, and are we, we using are. that? We are, and and we are. Um, so we have information from Smart Sharing. We have information from QPRs. We have a weekly report out from instructional coaches that bring kind of feedback from the field to the table. We have lots of different collaborative mechanisms, like district leadership team, like instructional council, etc. And there's a lot of beauty in that because you find those things that cause the ripples. 
Um, but what we're talking about here tonight is the tidal wave. So in, in order to really get that tidal wave, we really go back to the alignment piece. Because we will see um, you know, those, those short cycle wins, some small wins, um, a, a strategy at a time. Um, but it really is that kind of comprehensive uh, alignment that gives us the tidal wave. So yes, we are listening and we are replicating. We've seen things like um, a strategy around thinking maps, where kids are able to really uh, demonstrate their learning in multiple ways, go from an idea from one coach at one school to being in nine schools. Um, and so we'll have some you know, professional development contracts coming through for that really soon. And that's incredibly exciting. Um, We've seen lots of other, you know, different strategies from um, presentations with Pear Deck, um, how schools are organizing their PLCs, how one high school principal set aside two days of his time to meet intentionally with every PLC leader. Um, the, the way that we organized our, our PLC um, professional development really came from what one school was doing and doing really well. We went out and watched it and we sat with him and we learned from his team and then we shared that with everyone. So yes, we are listening and we are out finding those things that do work so that we can replicate. Um, and that the same thing will work across the district for every faculty or for every group of students. Um, but we're certainly providing those opportunities for principals to learn from each other, um, for teachers to learn from each other, and for coaches to learn from each other. Mr. Siegel? June just brought up something I was okay. unaware of. We have quality peer review for each of the schools. Um, yes, we do 10 per year, so they're all on a four-year cycle. And it, we will be replicating a, a very similar process with our three charters, two of which we will bring to the board this year. And uh, Mr. Scrivano will be reaching out. Actually, we'd love to have board participation in that process with our, with our two charter schools that are up this year. So um, th there's room for two if uh, people want to see firsthand with our, with our charter providers. Uh, Mr. Scrivano will be, uh, as board president, will be sharing that opportunity for the training. Yes. <laughs> That's best. Um, is this something that we have done for years? So we have trends on the quality peer review? We've been doing it for four years, but every school has only gone through one cycle. Okay. So we did have one high school. We redid it because we shifted the way that we do quality peer reviews at the high school level. So we matched the national standards of practice. Um, but yes, our goal was to have everybody have a baseline year, and then now we'll start our second cycle. And I'm sorry, when did you say that there would be a report on that? Or did you say there would be a, a report on that? If then if you didn't, could we have a report on that? <laughs> and on quality? Sure. Yep, so we've been looking at trends across our quality peer reviews. It's really the intent of the quality peer review is to do a peer analysis to provide feedback on specific criteria for the school to make improvement on. Yeah. Um, but we have looked at high level trends that I would be happy to bring and share. Um, so they don't get into the specifications of, you know, uh, classroom um, quality instruction, but it does talk, we have very specific things that we look at um, across multiple categories. So I can, I, we would be happy, I can bring Susan Fumo in, who really is the one who conducts the quality peer reviews, um, and we can do an overview on what that looks like. Um, we did present a couple times to Ed, the Ed Committee over the past several years, yep. um, so we can, you know, consolidate that information and come and share our story. I'd, be, I'd love to. And we're also actually utilizing that process. We crosswalked the quality peer review in the um, school uh, uh, assessment that they have to do under tier three and four on um, Fritland Power. So we're utilizing that information also to create those plans. I just wanted to also share that Heidi and Anisha are co-chairing the Ready to Learn project team, which is the Erickson survey stuff through Transform Rockford, Alignment Rockford, and the school district. and. I did ask, but I didn't hear from anybody that wanted to be there. So I'm going to go. Uh, it, it's Friday from 9 until noon at Unitarian Universalist Church. And that's the first kickoff meeting. So David, David and I will be there. And, uh, uh, and uh, I appreciate you doing that. So we're looking forward to that project. So OK, uh, I'm going to ask for adjournment then. Motion to adjourn. Members, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, All right, we are adjourned at 8.30 on the button.